seem like everybody watch the house of consciousness. Got them tuning in here in the States to every content. Oh, wow. You got your holy book, your references and documents, then hit your brother's sign, get it cracking if you're confident. Sign at the TV, it don't get no more reality. Nah. It's helping us stay mindful of the struggle in totality. Humble yourself and let the commentary resonate. Living in these times, this here is sure to help you. Yeah, yeah, in a new zone. Hope the dialogue ain't too strong. Y'all know that we've been waiting too long. And ever since I stepped into this paradigm, it's the time all I got is building on the TV mind. Is a black throne. Where kings and queens come get their facts on. Just be prepared to have your mind blown. And ever since I stepped into this paradigm, most of the time all I got is freedom on my mind. For real. Can you? environment to be in and we're busting pinatas yeah 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 y'all already know what it is peace and black power family you know we got say cool in the building say cool demolished the um i i call them the twins now you know what i'm saying say cool <laughs> i'm talking about garfield and unk those are <laughs> i could call them the knuck the knucklehead twins or or something yeah they the twins man you know, the Savage Twins or something like that. Yeah, that's the name. <laughs> so I'm going to make that name stick. The Savage Twins is in the building. Yeah. But anyway, say cool. You you did a hell of a good job. You know, you did a hell of a good job. You, uh, Brother Reggie, Smash, and um, it was awesome with, with, the, uh, with the champion, Brother Jabari. That was a wonderful um, show y'all did. Everybody's still talking about it, making videos and clips and stuff, brother. What's happening? Un unmute yourself. Yes, peace and blessings, Anela. It's always uh, good and it's a privilege for me to always be here. And I thank you always for giving me the opportunity to be on the house in the house of consciousness. And peace and blessing to all the OGs out there. And I'm happy to always be here to share knowledge, to learn, relearn, and unlearn. I think this is what this platform is all about. Last week was really good. We came on here to destroy uh, these brothers who are trying to put um, sand in what the ancestor scholars have done, establish, rescue the consciousness of Black people. And they think it's a game. They think it's a YouTube game. People die for these things. People gave up their life for these things so that the black man can walk on the street without bowing his head down. And some people think it's a YouTube game. It's not a YouTube game. It is about our life, our destiny, our children, our people, and our future. That's why we are not joking with it. That's why when I'm speaking, I speak with all passion because I understand I come from Africa. I come from that continent and I have experienced the all you talk about, the segregation, the overlook, the insult on that continent. And I know very well the potential that is there. I know very well what our ancestors have established for us. So for us to have all this opportunity in this generation to move forward, and here we are dragging our feet, trying to go back to the masters and say, am I right? Please come and come and tell me if I'm right. We are not ready to do that. Yeah, man. So um, talk to me about this great topic that you got. Nobody have done this topic yet over here. And um, why is this topic so important to you? And this should be important to many of us. Talk to us yes. about this. This is a very, very interesting topic tonight. And tonight. I, it's a teaching moment, and I want people to really sit back and enjoy. Let's discuss the, the, um, the topic. First of all, it's uh, 50 years uh, uh, fifty years after the Cairo Symposium. So many of you know that in 1974, Sheikh Anta Diop and Otiofilo Benga have to confront the European Egyptologists on this topic this topic we have right now in the community, where the ancient Egyptian black, 
they had to confront the best of the best in Europe at that time, in America. And they had a debate, a scientific debate, where there was a neutral ground and people were like, whatever you got, come and present it. Let us know who the ancient Egyptians were, who populated this land that we call Egypt. And Teofilo Benga and Sheikh Anta Diyu were only two in the midst of or nearly 20 to 30 participants who were all Europeans and Arabs, and they won the debate. And UNESCO, a, 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 UN, a United Nations organization, came out and said these two guys defeated all the European Egyptologists, and Egypt must now be returned into the African people intellectual property. Now, that was done 50 years ago. And it's important for us to remind people that debate took place. And the records are there, and we are here to present it. And the second part of the topic is the transition from Eurocentrism to the emergence of direct knowledge. Eurocentrism is the idea or the belief that Europe is the center of the world, that every knowledge and invention that ever happened in human history has to be connected to Europe or has to come from Europe. And this Eurocentric idea, whenever it comes against or it, 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 it finds another civilization that is equal to the tax, they have to find a way to whitewash, to whitewash that civilization. And that's Eurocentrism. It is in our schools. It is in our universities. It is in our colleges. And Sheikh Anta Diop and Obenga were able to demolish Eurocentrism. And they told young African people and say. The best way to get knowledge now is through direct knowledge. And direct knowledge means you don't have to go through the establishment. You need to do primary research. You need to go into the field and do the research yourself and arrive at your own truth. If you sit down and wait for the European sources to tell you the truth about African people's history, you will never get the facts. There you go. There you go. Hey, I always, when I hear y'all say that, I always quote Elijah Muhammad, the honorable Elijah Muhammad, because I want everybody to start quoting it. And the quote is, if the white man won't treat you right, what makes you think he's going to teach you right? And so we got to keep that in mind. You will never see the Jews having Hitler's people. Can you imagine the Jews calling over some, some um, Hitler scholars to come on over here and teach our babies and children? Come on, right. what do we look like? <laughs> you right. know? It's this crazy. is the thing I tell people, Sarnetta, the people have to understand that history is, first of all, political. Mm -hmm. And no people in the history of humanity has ever elevated other people's history. It has never happened. That's, the that's Chinese are not there to elevate European history. That is to announce their own death. It's like committing suicide. To tell Europeans to say ancient Egyptians were black and Africans give civilization to the world is to tell them to commit cultural suicide. Why would they do that? Why do you want them to do it? That's not their job. They will never do it. They have to protect their own and they are doing the right thing by protecting their own. It is our job to elevate our history. It is our responsibility to teach our kids. As individuals living in your neighborhood, do you think it is the responsibility of your neighbor to tell your kid what is good and what is bad? No, that's your neighbor. Don't give a damn. He's focused on his own thing. That's how history is. It is your thing. It is about your family, your ancestor, your contribution, and even your vision for the world. There's politics in it. So, so think that there is a, a, a good white guy out there who has to come and tell you, yeah, Garfield, I think this is what African history is. Oh, Ank, I think if you do that, then you are setting us up for destruction. And we are not willing to do that. That's why we choose direct knowledge. All right. And so with that, man, um, you got a presentation lined up for us tonight? Yes. That's good. And Let's I won't waste your time with share my screen. Yes, sir. Very quickly. I want y'all to get your pens, your pads, the screenshots. Get your popcorn. And, and um, get ready to ask questions at the end. Come on, y'all. Yes. Is this sharing, Sanero? Yes, I see it. 
and is up and running. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, 50 years after Cairo Symposium, reflecting on the transition from Eurocentrism to the emergence of direct knowledge. 50 years ago, UNESCO invited scholars from around the world. And first of all, you need to know what was happening 50 years ago. 50 years ago, African countries were emerging from colonialism into independence. 50 years ago, Europeans were leaving Africa after the, the, uh, after the Cold War has ended and African nations were emerging as new independent states and the European had to leave. The universities and the colleges, the curriculum were all written by the colonial masters. And while leaving, they say it is important for us to have a comprehensive understanding of African history because everything we know about Africa was told or written or commentary by people who are non-Africans. So we want to have a comprehensive understanding of African history as written and told by African people themselves. So the Cairo Symposium was called. It was to write a document called The General History of Africa, which is in a lot of volumes, if any of you have ever heard about this document. So in a particular part of that document, volume two, there was, it was on the topic of the peopling of Egypt. Who were the people who settled in the land that we call Egypt? Who built the pyramids? Who were the pharaohs? These mighty people who contributed to civilization, who the, the Greeks and the Romans revere. These people who continue to fascinate every generation of humankind for their greatness and their contribution to civilization. What human population do they belong to? Were they Chinese? Were they Arabs? Were they white? Or were they African? To answer this question, UNESCO called Sheikh Anta Diop to write a chapter in the general history of Africa. And Diop said, I'm not going to write the African origin of Egypt because I've done it several times and people think that I was trying to glorify black people. So in order for me to write in an important document such as a UNESCO document, I want to debate with the best Egyptologists in the world. Let us have a scientific debate about the origin of the ancient Egyptians. Whoever wins that debate, then the, 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 that person's argument should be the official and the mainstream uh, representation of the ancient Egyptian civilization. So 50 years ago, the Cairo Symposium was called. And tonight I'm doing my presentation on the reflection on that symposium. What were the outcome? What were the theories? And what, are, what is there for us to learn as a people? So here uh, I'm going to read from a document from UNESCO when they were trying to prepare for this debate in Cairo in 1974. And you can find this quote that I'm about to read from this document called The Peopling of Ancient Egypt and the Deciphering of Meruiti Script. You find it on the website of UNESCO. It said the symposium on the people of ancient Egypt and the deciphering of the Meruiti Script was held in two stages. The first took place from the 28th to the 31st of January, 1974, and concerned the peopling of ancient Egypt. And the second dealt with the deciphering of Meruiti script and took place from the 1st to the 3rd of February, 1974. So basically there were two groups. One was to decipher the Meruitic writing, the writings of the Nubians. And the second was to find out how ancient Egypt was people. So the documents continue. It said the members of international scientific community or committee has thought it necessary to convene a symposium on the people of ancient Egypt to bring together a number of specialists of world repute from different countries. The purpose was to review, was to review the knowledge at present available about the ethnic origin and anthropological relationship of the population 
about the cultural ties between Egypt and the rest of Africa. So basically they wanted to know who were the ancient Egyptians related to in modern context. They wanted to know who populated that area. What was their culture and who are they really connected to in terms of modern population? This is what they wanted to understand. And like they said, they invited the best of the best. And the list is very long. I have the list here, it's not on the screen, but I'm going to um, see if I can read some of it out. Some of the best, they got Egyptologists from France, they got Egyptologists from, from all over the world, Norway and all of these places. All these men came to present their own argument about ancient Egypt. Who were the ancient Egyptians? What ethnic stock do they belong to? So some of the names that you will hear from this symposium, uh, Professor Leclan. Professor Leclan was one of the best Egyptologists at that time in France. You have a Vercute. You have the professor from also, from also Sweden, Norway, United States, and the Arab war. All of them were brought together. And now these were the opposing theories. And it's important for you to know these theories so that you understand where the African school of thought came from. There were two opposing theories at the Cairo Symposium. And these are the theories I'm going to read to you now. It said there are two theories, both of them categorical. According to some, a great many, the Egyptian population is white, Mediterranean. As Vindier sums up, it may just, justly be claimed that the Egyptian ray is of hermetic origin. It is certain that the Negroes did not arrive in Egypt until late. According to others, as Obenga posed it, Egypt of the pharaohs, by virtue of their ethnic character and language of its inhabitants, belong wholly from its Neolithic infancy to the end of the native dynasties to the human past of the black people of Africa. There are two theories at the time. The first one is supported by the majority of the European school of thought. It said the ancient Egyptians were white. The second, it said they could have been of hermetic origin and we will find out who the Hamites are later. And they said the Negroes did not arrive in Egypt until late 18th dynasty. So the African school of thought of Teofilo Benga and Sheikh Antar Diop, they said the pharaohs, their language, their culture, and the people themselves belong to the African population, the various groups of African people. These were the two theories. Now let's look at the extreme, the extreme form of these two theories. Theory number one, supported by white people, white Egyptologists. They said the people who live in Egypt were white even though their pigmentation was dark or even black as early a pre-dynastic period. Negroes made their appearance only in the 18th dynasties onward. So this is important to understand this argument. 50 years ago, Egyptologists were teaching that ancient Egyptians were white and they are, even though their skin is dark, they were still white even from the pre-dynastic period. Now I'm asking you, anyone out there, have you ever seen a white person with a dark, with a black skin? It sounds ridiculous, but this is what they were saying. It sounds really, really ridiculous, but this was the argument of the best scientists at the time, that the ancient Egyptians were dark skin or even black, but they were not Negro. Who are the Negroes? Nobody knows. So this is the extreme part of the African argument here in number two. It said the ancient Egyptian was people from the Neolithic infancy to the end of the native dynasty, but black Africans. These are the two opposing theories in their extreme form. Now, the, this, is, this image that you see here that was posted by Mr. Imhotep come from the symposium itself. When all these experts convene, in fact, we don't have videos of the symposium, the Cairo symposium, unfortunately, 
And people have written to UNESCO several times to get the videos, and they said there is no video. Apparently, they destroyed the videos because they were humiliated. You can see all these experts sitting down here. Now, the topic that they are discussing, their disagreement, but then they were all supposed, they were supposed to present their evidence to support their claim. So here are the scientific uh, argument that they have to use. Physical anthropology, the study of ancient remains preserved by climate. They have to study the mummies. They have to study the bones. They have to study all these things. If you say ancient Egyptian were white, we have to study the mummies and see if they were. Their iconography, covering all the, present, the, the representation and the forms, the drawing, the painting, and the bas reliefs. Here, we have to look at the iconography, which is the representation that we see on the wall. How did the ancient Egyptian paint themselves? How did they depict themselves? Did they paint themselves as white people, as Mediterranean, or did they present themselves as African people? These are the things that they were that, that were that were presented during the debate. Then there was the issue of linguistics. What language did the ancient Egyptians speak? And what language family can we trace that language to? Is it an Asiatic language? Is it a Semitic language? Is it an Indo-European language or is it an African language? That was also an issue. Then the issue of ethnology. What culture could they be closer to? So Diop and Obenga were very clear in their argument. They said, well, we have never seen black pe uh, white people with a black skin. If there is a black man who walked uh, 3,000 years ago in Egypt without shirt on and building the pyramid, and we can clearly see that he is dark, who will just call him a black man in Africa. We don't have to call him anything else. If we saw a white man walking in Europe with a white skin, we call him white. But we cannot see a black man walking in Africa clearly depict himself on the wall. Then you said he is dark, he is black, but then he is a white man with a black skin. That become ridiculous. Then they went to the issue of language where Dio was able to prove that the argument that ancient Egyptian language is Afro-Asiatic is very, very complicated. But when you, when you, when you break even the Afro-Asiatic into groups, you find out that it does not belong to the Semitic branch of the Afro-Asiatic family. Many of the Afro-Asiatic family of, uh, uh, in, in this language, including Chadic, including the other branches, they are all found in Africa. And the ancient Egyptian language is definitely an African language. And this was debated very heatedly. And the, the funny part is that they, they see the evidence before them because Obenga and Diop didn't just go there to just talk. They went with the evidence and they demonstrated it on the board. And one of the linguists there who came from France, he said, you cannot deny that there is a connection between the ancient Egyptian language and African language. There is a genetic connection that you cannot, you cannot, you cannot refute it. So that was admitted in the, in the symposium. Now, some of the arguments that came up during the debate, some of the most racist arguments, which I think most of you are aware of, and, you can, and those arguments still prevail today. And we find some of those arguments even among African black brothers who are repeating this argument. One of those arguments is this. The Egyptians were black, but they were not Negro. Have you heard that before? The ancient Egyptians were black, but they were not Negro. By the way, I'm going to play a video soon with Zai Hawass saying exactly those words. And we heard Chief X repeat this. They are not Negro. So during the symposium, Diop went and tested the mummy. He took part of the mummies and tested them and they look at the pigmentation, what they call the melanin dosage test, and they find out that the, the pharaohs were black skin. So when somebody is black and he's in Africa, how do you call them? They say, well, they were black, but they were not Negro. So who is this Negro? 
and we are going to find out. And this Negro that was invented by Euro Europeans, racist Europeans, Egyptologists, this Negro that we don't know, we've never met, that live in some part of Africa and disconnected with the rest of Africa, this Negro is what Diop said. We don't know this Negro. You guys have to reveal him to us. Because when we see a black man or a dark skin, brown skin, whatever variation of black we see in Africa, that's the black man. Another argument they say, the ancient Egyptians were not Africans, but they were not sub-Saharan. Have you heard that argument before? It also came from the Cairo Symposium. They were not Africans, but they were not sub-Saharan. What is sub-Sahara? And at what point was this Sahara uh, uh, came into existence? Has, has this, the, the Sahara Desert always been there? Has it always been an impassable barrier? This is where Diop dealt with them. He did, a, he did, this is where Diop did what they call direct knowledge. He went on the field and did research. He even did a carbon dating of the Sahara. And he showed that from 8,000 BC, the Sahara was still wet. It was still a grassland. It was still a, a savanna. And there was no such a thing, that impassable barrier for African people. The Nile Valley was a, was a highway of culture of African people coming from deep south down all the way to, 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 the, to the north. So to say that there are a group of people, African, called sub-Saharan, who are disconnected from the west of Africa, from North Africa, for since the time of the of the, of the early human, does not make any sense. But this argument continues to prevail, even today among the African communities. Another argument they say, well, if you insist, then we are going to say the ancient Egyptians were multicultural, they were Afro-Asiatic, or they were mixed. Now, this other argument. It came out of the Cairo Symposium as well. And it was one of the participants, I think from Norway, who made this argument. That look, we can, we can make a compromise, okay? You guys say they were dark skinned, they were black. We can clearly see from the iconography, they look dark, they look black, they are hair, we see everything. Okay, let's call them multicultural. They were mixed, they were Afro-Asiatic. Does that settle it? We say, well, that is another way to change the goalpost. And this is what most of the mainstream today, they are holding on to. They are holding on to this. They were multicultural. They were Afro-Asiatic. But they, are, they, they, didn't, they didn't just pop up and become multicultural overnight. They were unhomogeneous people in the beginning. They didn't just come from under the ground and become Afro-Asiatic. We have to establish the point at which they got in contact with the other people from Asia. We have to establish at what point they began to be mixed. You can't just say they popped out of the ground and they were just multicultural and mixed. That's not how it's going to work. This is another argument that is now used by the the, the, the recent Egyptologists, this is the, the point in which they have, they have moved from the Negro uh, part, they've moved from the Sub-Saharan part, they came down to, to the mix. Then another argument, they said the Nubians were darker than the Egyptians, therefore they were not supposed to be black. So Sheikh Antadio, during the conference, he's like, do all Europeans have the same color? Are you guys willing to do that? We are willing to test? Are we ready to bring a man from Scandinavia and compare him with the Southern Italian? Are they all not Europeans? Are they not all Caucasian and white? But are you sure we can bring a man from Scandinavia with the blue eyes and his blonde hair and compare him with the Southern Italian? They say, oh, no, 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 you can't do that, dear. But it's okay. If we cannot do that, why are you surprised? that the Nubians should be darker than the Egyptian. In South Africa, are the Khoisan not lighter than the Zulu? Are they not all South Africans? The Khoisan are very, very lighter than the Zulu. But are they not all African and Black Africans? Why? If the Khoisan were to represent, if the Khoisan had a powerful kingdom 
in pre-colonial Africa, and they had a war with the Zulu. Don't you think they would have presented the Zulu with darker complexion, and they would have presented themselves with lighter complexion? Will that make them white or mixed? The Nubians or the Sudan today have some of the darkest skinned people even in Africa until this day, until this day. They are called black by other black Africans. They are blue black. Does that mean then if they come in contact with any brown African people, then those all they, they, they are the only black people then remaining on the continent? These are the ridiculous arguments that they brought to the Cairo Symposium. And those arguments exist today, unfortunately, with the Negro Pian School and the Eurocentrist. Another one, the last one here. They say, well, there is no cultural link between the pharaohs and other African civilization. If Africans were connected to Egypt, where is the hieroglyphics in Mali? Where is the hieroglyphic in Songhai? Where is the hieroglyphic? This is another ridiculous argument they make. They are seeing it as when we say ancient Egypt is an African civilization. Therefore, every African kingdom and country has to have a hieroglyphics. That sounds very ridiculous. It's like they are saying it is Egypt that gave birth to Africans. No, it is the other way around. They are saying the culture which produced Egypt is came, was developed and grown out of the South and evolved until it produced what you call Egypt. But people continue, they don't get it. They keep saying, why we don't find hieroglyphics here? As if that's what it's supposed to be. And I saying that we have to find a, a, a Greek philosopher among the Vikings before we know that they were all Europeans. It doesn't make any sense. And this argument continues to exist. And Diop and Obenga demolish this argument one after the other, as she shall see. The sub-Saharan argument the Sub-Sahara Africa argument. It came from this guy here that you see on the screen, Hegel. Hegel is the one who, he's, well, this is what he said. Africa must be divided in three parts. One is that which lies south of the desert of the Sahara, Africa proper, the upland almost entirely unknown to us. The narrow coast tract along the sea, the second, is that to the north of the desert, the European Africa. You see the politics? He's calling North Africa the European Africa. The coastline, the third is a river region of the Nile, the only valley in the land of Africa, which is in connection with Asia, Africa proper. As far as history goes back, has remained for all tall purposes of, uh, for all tall purposes of connection with the rest of the world, shut up. The land of childhood, which lying beyond the day of self-conscious history, is enveloped in the dark, in the dark mantle of the night. Now, in case my reading is not perfect, I hope you are looking at the screen. Hegel said there are two Africa. There is one Africa that lies south of the Sahara. That Africa is the land of child, of childhood. He's saying that we are dumb. He said that Africa is enveloped in darkness. But the European Africa, he's now trying to claim Egypt now. The European Africa is, is the one connected to Asia. When you say sub saharan Africa, this is the man you are trying to validate. This racist, Hegel. When you use the term sub saharan Africa, this is the man you are glorifying. This is the way these people march into our continent. They don't know our history. They decided to carve our destiny by deciding what our continent is and what it should not be and what it should be. Who gave them the authority? And most of you here repeat these things. You repeat them every day. You fight us. You, even when you are insisting to repeat them. So what are you doing? 
That's why Diop call you to go into direct knowledge. Because if you don't go into direct knowledge, you have to be citing these type of sources that insult our intelligence. Africa is not a land of childhood. Africa is not enveloped in darkness. There are several civilizations beyond Egypt that we shall see. And thank goodness, this is 2024, right? The latest book on the findings on Egypt. We can see here a writing in 2023. This book come out in 2023 by Christopher Aaron. He tried to clarify on the recent finding about this issue of sub-Sahara Africa and the issue of North Africa. Where does the modern debate lie? And also, where does the, the ancient Egyptian culture, where did it come from? Is it from that quote-unquote sub-Sahara or it came out of the Middle East? But yes, what Christopher said. He said, it's striking here that this ritual accompaniment of the death of kings similarly took place equally early farther south and that it was the ritual feature present still in the second millennium BCE during the high age of the Kerman kingdom of upper Nubian Nile region. More than that, this ritual practice is one that historians have encountered in the history of a number of later Nilo-Saharan Nilo speaking or Nile Sahara influenced it in the Sudan belt of Africa from pre-Christian Nubia in half of the millennium CE. So as far as west, as late as in the time of Wagadu Empire of Ghana. Let me tell you what I'm reading. Christopher Eret said, the rituals that we see in early Egypt, how they buried their kings, the rituals that we see in kingship and how the kings are buried, in Egypt, we can trace it back to Sudan. We can trace it back to Nahalo Saharan culture. And guess what? We can trace it back to West Africa in Wagadu Empire of Ghana. Now, if we say, you say we are Afrocentric, if we say the Ghana Empire was an offshoot of the end of the, 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 the Egypt Nubian culture, you are going to say, well, these are Afrocentric, they are trying to make themselves feel good. Okay, this is now a white scholar saying it. And this is a modern book in 2023 that the burial system in Ghana Empire can be traced back to Egypt. What do you guys have to say now? Where is the sub Sahara nonsense now? This is, this is an African scholar. There will be a lot of attack. But this is what his expert, and he's a professor. And I hope Ank is reading this because he said he knows how to connect people to the expert. Now, this is what the experts are saying. The burial system in Ghana Empire can be traced to Nubia. It can be traced up to Egypt. And who said it first? Sheikh Antadio. And this is what he said at the UNESCO conference. He said, the structure of African royalty with the king put to death, either really or symbolically after a reign, which very was, was in the region of eight years, recall the ceremony of the Pharaoh regeneration through the said feast, also reminiscent of Egypt at the circumcision rite mentioned in earlier and totemism, cosmogony, architecture, musical instrument of black Africa. He said, everything you see in Egypt, the ceremony of the kings, the regeneration of the king, the, the animal totems and the cosmogony, the architecture, their musical instrument, everything is of black African culture. You guys are so fascinated with the pyramid because there is no pyramid in, 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 in deep south, even though we found structures like that. But you forget that the culture you are seeing in Egypt is an offshoot of African people. That's what Diop said. Everything. And when Christopher Harris said in 2023, he's just repeating Diop, but just refusing to cite him. That's all. He's just refusing to cite him. So Diop destroyed their argument. He demolished their argument in the Cairo Symposium and said, look, all this culture you guys are fascinated with, it comes from the deep south. It does not come from the north. It does not come from Asia. 
And the Africans have been saying this for centuries, I mean, uh, uh, for, for, for decades. And now it has been proven. And modern scholars are coming to turn. If you like, call it Afrocentric. One of the important arguments that the Ethiopian school had, even during the Cairo Symposium, it was touched on a little bit, is the flora and the fauna of Egypt. The flora and fauna means the animals and the plants in Egypt that you see in the hieroglyphic writing, that you see on their wall. Most of those animals are native to either the Nile Valley or deep south into Africa. The plant they use, the animals they use in their decoration, in their painting, everything, none of them have nothing to do with Euro-Asian or Middle East. These were all indigenous to Africa, as we shall see. Number one, the baboon. You've all seen the baboon, how it is a very, very important animal in the Egyptian uh, uh, spirituality and their world, their philosophy. Where do you find these baboons? In Saudi, in, 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 uh, in, 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 in the Middle East? Well, these baboons are coming from deep south in Africa, around the area of Eritrea and other places. And these were very important, even in the Great Lake region of Congo. Uganda, Rwanda, this is where you find these animals. And the, all of these countries I mentioned are control, are somehow connected to the Nile. Your crocodile, you find a hippopotamus, you find even the, 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 this plant that they use to make the papyrus. This particular type, because there are many types of, uh, of variation of many species of this type of plant that you find some of it in India, but this particular plant is found in the Nile Valley, it's indigenous to the continent. So the Egyptians have to be very, they were native to the continent. They didn't come from anywhere else. The animals, the, everything that they, they were dealing with come out of the continent to tell you their ancestral connection to these things. The, you find the Ibis bird that they used to represent Jehuti. These were all the lion. These were all things that were present that were indigenous to the continent. Now the debate went on. Here is the conclusion from UNESCO. Because the Europeans came to the debate, they came to a gunfight with knife. They were not prepared. They thought, well, what are these two Africans going to do? What are they going to say? You know, nothing. But they were surprised, they were shocked. The amount of evidence that Diop and Obenga came with, irrefutable evidence. And here's what UNESCO said. This is now UNESCO writing this. Professor Diop theory, which says that Africans were the one who population ancient Egypt from the Neolithic period until the last native dynasty. They said, Professor Diop's theory was rejected in its entirety by one participant. Remember, there were more than, or close to 30 people, but only one participant rejected the theory of Diop. Now, have you ever heard in the, in the community they said Diop was rejected at the Cairo Symposium? No, it's a lie. Here is the document we are reading to you. Professor Diop's theory was rejected in its entirety by one participant. None of the participants explicitly voiced support for earlier theory concerning a population which was white or dark or even black pigmentation. There was no more than a tacit agreement to abandon this old theory. You can find this in the UNESCO book, General History of Africa, Volume 2, the 1990 version on page 43. What are they saying here in this first quote? The European Egyptologists, they said they have abandoned the Hamai theory. They have abandoned the dark Mediterranean theory. They have abandoned the white Egypt theory. This was Cairo Symposium. That's what it did for us, for people who don't know. For the first time, Egyptologists, globally, we are forced to abandon this fake news that ancient Egyptians were not black people. I read it again. Professor Diop theory was rejected in its entirety by one participant. But none of the participants explicitly voiced support 
for earlier theory concerning a population which was white or with dark or even black pigmentation. There was no more than a tacit agreement to abandon this old theory. Let us see what it says in the second quote. Although the preparatory working paper sent out by UNESCO gave particular to what was desired, now all participants had prepared communication comparable with the painstakingly research contribution of Professor Shekanta Diop and Obenga. There was consequently a real lack of balance in the discussion. Now, here they are playing with words, but if you understand English, they are saying they got whooped, they were defeated. That's what they are trying to say with good words. They said there was lack of balance in the argument when Diop and Obenga presented their argument The European could not provide a counter argument. When I go to a debate with someone and I present argument and the person have no counter argument, it means that I defeated them. That's what it means. Logically, that's what it means. The court says it here. No, not all participants had prepared communication comparable with the painstaking research contribution of Professor Sheikh Anta Diop and Obenga. There was consequently a real lack of balance in the discussion. Here was the end of the Eurocentric idea of ancient Egypt and the birth of direct knowledge. Direct knowledge, the African people must now take their own destiny in their own hand must write their own history. They do not need commentaries from Chinese or Europeans or Arabs. They need to take the stand on their own history and be the masters of their own destiny. This is where the Diopian school defeated the Egyptologists. But anyone today who discusses ancient Egypt and does not begin with this debate, this is the greatest scientific debate on Egypt, the person is playing game with you. Anyone who write books on ancient Egypt and they try to discuss their ethnic origin and avoid discussing UNESCO conference, the person is playing game with you. Because this is where there was a paradigm shift. Now, the new generation wants to come out with multiculturalism, multiracialism. They even want to use the genetics to come and play game. But the Ethiopian school have defeated the Eurocentric 50 years ago. And this theory that ancient Egyptian came from the south to populate that place. And that the Nubian, that they were of Nubian stock, has remained unchallenged. No one has been able to destroy or discard that theory. Those who play around it, if they are black people, they are just coward. If they are European, they are just being racist. I didn't say that. It was Christopher Eret, and we shall see. The course tool. All of you, if you read Sheikh Antadio book, you, you, he, see, he talk about the findings of the course tool by Bruce Williams. This is an important artifact, an incense burner that was found in Nubia. And on this incense burner, you for Jabari discussed this several times on this channel, that you find on this incense burner all the motifs, all the cultural motifs that will later be seen in ancient Egypt. The crown, the falcon as Heru, and all of these things that, that we will see later in ancient Egypt as important emblems in their culture. These emblems were already found on this incense burner deep south into Nubia from a, a, a culture called the Kustu, which has already existed, where they have already practiced these things. So this culture gave birth to what you call Pharaonic Egypt, and it did not come from the north. Here's what Christopher Harris says about this finding in 2023. This is recent. Because you guys that are against this theory of Diop, you say, oh, the, the Diop scholars, they are outdated. You know, uh, the time they argued 1974, there was no genetics. Their time has passed on. There is new evidence. Well, I'm reading the new evidence now. I'm reading the 2023 book now. The coastal elite rulers in the second half of the fourth millennium participated together with their counterpart of communities of Nagada culture of southern Egypt in creating an emerging culture 
and paraphernalia of pharaonic rule. The finds from coastal site include in Williams War images associated with a rising Egyptian dynastic culture. The culture of the pharaohs will come from the south, deep south, artifact upon artifact, giving us the evidence. Those who come from the south, who are of Nubian stock, who come from the Horn of Africa, what were they? Chinese? I guess not. They were black Africans. Now the falsification of history. Even as we overwhelming evidence from the Diopian school that have destroyed the Egyptologists, and since then they've been running around trying to create new theories. The falsification of African history continues even today. And I ran into one of them just recently. There's a lot of them, but there's just one I ran into, which I want to give you an example of it. Look on the screen. You see this uh, lady, Laura Marshall, the author of Harkoof. So she published a book, children book actually. And this children book was meant to talk about a man called Harkoof. Harkoof was the first explorer in history. He was an ancient Egyptian explorer who was sent into inner Africa to go and explore, especially the Great Lake region. If you find his tomb where he gives story of his expedition, even under, on, I think in the sixth dynasty, he also did his expedition under Pepe, Pharaoh Pepe. He was the one who brought the Dua from the Great Lake region into Egypt. Harkuf was the man you will call the one of the earlier explorer in human history, if not the first. Harkuf have accomplished a lot of missions into Nubia and deep south into the Libra region in the land they call Yam, which some people have identified are probably the Great Lake region in inner Africa. But you can see the representation of Har Harkuf on the wall in his tomb. A man with a dreadlocks, with his brown skin. But when this woman wrote a book for children to explain the story of Arkuf, to, to, to help children to become creative, to learn the story of this great man, guess what she did? Look at the book she wrote. She presented Karkuf as a white man with a blue eyes, with a blonde hair, without shirt on, in Africa during explore expedition. This is the falsification of history. That when we talk it up, when we talk about it, you call it Egyptomania. What more can be this? Is it not is this Egyptomania or this is the falsification of history? Here is your new Harkov on the cover of this book by Laura Masha that your children will be buying in the bookstore reading about the greater explorer, the first explorer in human history who have gone around Africa and took record. And guess what? He looked like a Scandinavian. He has blue eyes and he has no shirt on in an African hot sun. This is false. This is the real man. He represented himself on the wall. Was, why couldn't this lady decide to represent this this great African explorer, as an African, she will not do it. And Garfield will not talk against this. He might probably buy a book like this for his child. Ank might buy a book like this for his children. Because when we put a black man there, then it's Egyptomania. Well, here's what they are doing with our story. Don't our children deserve the right to know that the first explorer in the world was a black man? Like them? Don't they deserve the right to know? Don't they deserve to open the book pages and see the man with their skin of their color during exploring Africa, going into the lake, Great Lake region? Don't they deserve that? Isn't that good for their mental health, for their creativity, for their psychology and their, their self-esteem? No wonder in our community Creativity, beauty is associated with non-African. 
No wonder when the African does it, it's doubtful. But when other people do it, then it's okay. No wonder when Jabari said the virgin birth of Mary that we find in the Bible originate out of the Nile Valley. They call him pseudo. But when Kara Kuni comes and says the same thing, then we take a glass of water. What has happened to you, black man, that you will be so much a coward that you cannot take possession of your own history? Who has bewitched you? Do you think we need permission for anyone to write the story of Egypt? I bet we don't. Do you think I need the permission for anyone to write a book on Harkuf and his expedition into the Great Lake region? This is what they are doing with our story. Look at this image. I took this image by myself with my phone and I visited the school of my son. Okay? But these images, they are all over in Canada. When you go, you visit any school in Canada. If you visit any school in Canada, you are going to see an image of ancient Kemet on the wall. Garfield, the Canada is Egyptomania. Let me tell you now. Every European school, it be Catholic school, it be private school, it be government school, you will find somewhere on the wall there is something about ancient Kemet. But guess what they do? The image they put in does not look like African. But when we do it, we are Egyptomania. But they do it in their commercials. They do it in their schools. They do it in all the best places of their life. Somehow the black man does not have the right to speak about his history. I took this picture on the wall by myself. And these are all over in all schools. If you have children, if you if you visit if you visit Canada, visit all the elementary school, high school, you find something of Egypt on the wall. That's how brilliant, how great this civilization has contributed to the world. But when they present it, they exclude the African character. They exclude the African personality out of it because they don't want to present you to the world that you give civilization to the world. They don't want that. And since history is politics, they use the politics to play on the game on you. And any people who play game with your history, they are getting ready for extinction. That's what it is. You're getting ready for extinction. Because when you allow other people to control your narrative, to control your history, to control what you perceive as reality, then you no longer have the right to exist. That's what it is. You no longer have the right to exist because you are a proxy. When I walk around and I see these things on the wall, where is the African personality on this wall? You can see how they put it very closely to a Greek or Roman character standing right beside the picture. This is what is happening even after Cairo Symposium. This is what Christopher had. Now the DNA hist. That's another argument that is up. They say, well, Seku, you understand? Seku likes to read old books. He likes to read Diop. He likes to read Chancellor Williams. He likes to read John Henry Clark. He likes to read uh, uh, um, uh, Dr. Ben. These books are old, Seku. You like to read um, uh, um, uh, books like, um, what is it called now? Um they they stolen legacy by just gm james they said say cool you see you are reading old books let's follow the new evidence Diop is 1974 just gm james books is written in the in, in in the 50s why can't you look for the new evidence now there's dna that showed that the ancient egyptian were not black i said well are you sure that's what the dna says they say yeah this is what a modern scholar is saying. Christopher Herod again. I'm quoting him what he said about that DNA test. That all of you, uh, uh, um, uh, how the uh, people like Chief X and his DNA. The, I call it the DNA heist. Let's see what Christopher says about this. 
is that the assertion in a recent such article, for example, that there is no sub-Saharan component in the Egyptian population betrays an unexamined assumption that traces back to racist early 20th century scholarship, that there was something like a true Negro type and that this pure type was represented by certain coastal West African population. But the North Africa, of course, but he said the Horn of Africa, of course, is also entirely south of the Sahara. So the assertion that there is no sub-Saharan genetic component in Egypt is nonsense. I repeat it again. The assertion that there is no sub-Saharan genetic component in Egypt is nonsense. This is a European. Since truth is white, at least you guys will allow you you accept this one. Because if a black man says it, then it's doubtful. Now, Massa have said it. The assertion that there is no sub-Saharan genetic component in Egypt is nonsense. Why does Christopher Harris say it's nonsense? He said because the people and the culture came from the South. Horn, that's why he mentioned Horn of Africa. East Africa, the Nubian stock. So all the genetic games you are playing with later for people who came into Egypt is all nonsense. These are scholars saying it. This is not Seku smoking some pipe. This is what Diop said. The Egyptian antiquity is to African culture where Greco-Roman antiquity is. Uh, the Egyptian antiquity is to African culture where the Greco-Roman antiquity is to Western culture. The build-up of a corpus of African humanity should be based on this fact. The Egyptian culture, the Nubio Egyptian culture, is African 100%. The language, the spirituality, the way of thinking, their vision of the world, and the people themselves belong to the African stock. Whether people came from Levant and later they got married to them, well, there are Africans still marrying people of all races. It's happening. But the reality is the culture and the people who established that civilization move from south to north. Nobody can demolish that, not even in 2030. So the civilization belongs to us. The cowards among us can continue to be cowards, but we must protect our history, write about it, and do what the ancestral scholars have told us. They said we should abandon the ancestral scholars because they are outdated. Well, debunk them. Go and bring your primaries. Go and do the direct knowledge for you to go to any library and pop the, any book and come and read it to others. Say, I got a new source. I got a new source where there are sources I can give you that says that black people are not even human, written by Europeans. They are sources. That's what Diop said. We must depart from the idea that just because it is a source, then it is right. We have to go into direct knowledge. What does the evidence lead? We have to be in the field and do primary research and establish our truth in every generation. We have to be at the forefront of every study and not wait for other people to make commentary about us and we consider it to be fact. That would be a dangerous path to, to, to tread as African researcher. If you are listening to this and you are a young man or young lady and you are an African descent, whether you be African-American, Caribbean, or uh, African proper, the African school of thought is built on direct knowledge. That is to say, just because there is a scholar consensus on something in Europe does not validate it to be fact. The African school will have a primary research, verify, prove and disprove to be able to either align or depart from that so-called scholarly consensus. That is the way to move. Truth is not unique to a particular group of people. Everyone have the intellectual capacity and ability to verify truth. That's what we must do. And history is political. And you don't expect anyone to do their politics against themselves. They must do their politics in favor. When they say where well, people that are scientists are objective, where well, their objectivity 
cannot go beyond those who who, who, who sponsored them, those who um, gave them money, who fund their research. If a Jewish organization funds a research, that research cannot be anti-Jewish. If a European organization funds a research, that research cannot be anti-European. So for you guys to sit there and you don't fund any African research and say, you are expecting the other people to make a research and come and agree with us. Imagine if Diop has not gone to the Cairo Symposium. All the research that was done, it said that you, the ancient Egyptians were white. Even if they were dark skinned, then they were white people with dark skin. And all of us were drinking coffee with that nonsense, and we think it's, it makes sense. But Diop went to the ground. He established the carbon cutters, his own laboratory. He went and do his own research. He did the mommy, the, 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 the melanin dose test. He went to the Sahara and did testing. He did not rely on their, on their samples. That's why in this community, I continue to, to respect Brother Asar Imhotep, who some of you don't want to see him and say because he said Kemet doesn't mean by black, uh, land of the black, you, you, you try to crucify him. I love the brother because he is doing direct knowledge. He has a methodology. He is doing primary research. He is saying the Coptic language, which we are using to decipher the ancient Egyptian, is good. But the Coptic is not the oldest version of the Egyptian language. There are African languages which might perhaps be some of the oldest relatives of the ancient Egyptian language from which we can derive some meaning or some Egyptian word. And people want to crucify him for that. But he's doing direct knowledge. He's doing primary research. You don't have to agree with him. But that's what the scholars ask us to do, primary research. Not to, not to be like Ank and just go open Gobino's book and try to convince people just because it's written in it's fact. Just because this person with this skin color says it, so it has to be true. Just because this PhD said it, so no questioning of it. That's, if we have done that, then all European 19th century scholars who condemn us to death, who have reduced us to animals, they would have been right. When Antonio Fermer wrote his book, The Equality of Races, that was not the scholarly consensus in France. So this is what I want people to see. Now, this is the last slide, but I want to play a video by Zai Hawaz, which I'm going to close with in making my commentary. So I'll stop my screen and then I will share that video. But sir, I think you will make a disclaimer of copyright before I play the video. I like will play the video by Zai Hawass. And uh, the it's very, very... Right under you, it's been there. Huh? It's been there. Oh, okay. All right, Sadneda. Just a few minutes and I'm going to... I have... All right. My screen is sharing. Yes, it is. Okay. So how long is the video? It's it's uh less than five minutes. Is it too long? Yeah. yeah. Long as you don't play the whole video. Uh I actually it's not the entire I kind of download it. I only pick a part of the video. It was okay. on the YouTube. You're gonna be speaking, stopping it and speaking. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I'm going to do. Way, that's good. Like you stop okay. it and you're speaking, because you know. All right. All right. Uh, is it full screen or I should make it full? Uh, yeah, make it. Yeah. It's full screen now? Yes, it is. You got okay. it. All right. Well, let's go. Ancient Egypt has long been described as one of the greatest civilizations of all time. The Sphinx, Pyramids of Giza, and countless more treasures still to be unearthed. The River Nile has a history as long as its body. But we'll get into that later. Here in the heart of ancient Egypt, what we know about the civilization is largely from what has been left. Now, this is a Nigerian journalist goes into Egypt to go and interview Zai Hawaz, 
if the ancient Egyptian were black people. Zai Hawar is an Arab Egyptologist in Egypt who is one of the most racist. Listen to him saying Egyptian were black, but they are not Negro, and also other things in this video. Left behind, artifacts reveal the Egyptians had a diverse belief system, its own language, and a complex hierarchical and political structure. But there are some questions with divided answers, namely that of the ethnicity of the ancient Egyptians. Africans, sure, but were they black? Sheikh Anta Diop was a Senegalese historian and anthropologist. He was a firm believer that the ancient Egyptians were in fact black. According to his research, the skulls of ancient Egyptians had physical features resembling the peoples of the Upper Nile region, East Africans and Nubians, all visibly black populations. But his theories aren't shared by all experts on the matter. We spoke to Dr. Zahi Hawass, an award-winning, world-renowned archeologist. His life's work has been dedicated to the discovery and research of ancient Egyptian antiquities. Not surprisingly, his office is full of books on the topic, some of which depict dark-skinned ancient Egyptians. But he says there's an explanation. No, they were dark-skinned, but they were not black. But they are not negro. You hear that? The ladies are going to take it back a little bit. Take it back again. Black. But they are not negro. Mm. Because, but they were not black. But they are not negro. Mm. He said, yes, they are dark skin, but they are not negro. This is the argument Chief X makes as if negro is certain type of human being that we have never seen before. Because what is negro? In if you speak Spanish or Portuguese, that, that word just means black. But what they are actually trying to say is to go back to the slavery period where the word Negro was invented on the, in, in Americas to describe an inferior being. That Negro means inferior. Negro means this type of African who is unintelligent. That's what indirectly they are trying to tell you. So when we find intelligent black person in Africa, we will call him something else. We can associate him with Solomon, we can say he's connected to Sheba. We can say uh, he's alien, but we will make sure that he's not Negro. This is the game. Because look at the, the, the lips of the, the Negroes like that and the nose like this. It's not really the Egyptian uh, origin at all. It's mm. different, completely different. Mm. And this is why we have, you cannot connect the Egyptian civilization with the from Shelley Prasbite, and he announced it that the origin of the Egyptian were Negro, mm -hmm. based on the statues of Ramses II and the statues of, uh, of Tutankhamun. See how he lies. He said, Sheikh Antar Dio said the ancient Egyptian were black because of the statue of Tutankhamun. Can you, are you kidding me? There was a scientific debate, which I just showed you in 1974. All the greatest Egyptologists around the world met and deal one on linguistics, on iconography, on anthropophysical anthropology. And this man reduced all of that to one statue. He said because Diop saw one statue that was black, then he ran away and said Asian Egyptians are black. This is how they play on the intelligence of people. Moon was black. And actually UNESCO did make a conference to discuss that. And they said there is no evidence to have to postpone this. Another group, Diop's research, claims to justify a black identity in ancient Egypt, but the Kushites of Kush Kingdom. Originating in what is today Sudan, the kingdom began in 1070 BC and lasted some 1,400 years. It was after King Kushta invaded Egypt in the 8th century BC, Kushite kings ruled the 25th dynasty of Egypt as pharaohs for a century. But what race were the Egyptians the Kushites met when they got there? It's true that the black from Kush ruled Egypt in 1925. Right. And this is what the black Americans are proud of. Yes. But they mix the 25th dynasty. Now he threw a shot on black Americans. He said, because it's true 
that the black people rule Egypt from the 25th dynasty, and that's what the black Americans are proud of. They make it as a black American thing. It's not a black American thing. This is a scientific question, and it has been the Diop and Obenga who went to Cairo to debate. We are not, we are not black Americans, they were they were Africans, and they told you the ancient Egyptians were black. But you see it on YouTube often. People think it is African Americans who are trying to steal Egyptian history. That's fake news again. That's not true. With the old kingdom and the new kingdom. They don't know the difference. Then they think that Egypt is a black civilization. It's not true. The black from Kush in the south ruled Egypt. It's a fact. Yes. But it's not the Egyptian civilization. It's not a Negro uh, civilization. Other theory that I believe in it, that the Egyptians were Egyptians. With arguments for and against ancient Egyptian blackness, we decided to take our own journey to the past. It began at the Egyptian Museum of Antiquities, otherwise known as the Museum of Cairo. It's home to many gracious artifacts, telling many stories of ancient Egypt's history, and we're hoping to find some answers. Inside the museum, we take a closer look at the place housing more than 100,000. Now, listen to this lady. It's an Arab lady also, but probably she's mixed. I don't know. But she is going to say, yes, they are black. She's going to go against Zai Hawa. And she's also in, in the museum. Watch. thousand pieces of history. Here we stand in front of a statue of Akhenaten. The pharaoh ruled during the 18th dynasty of Egypt and was husband to Queen Nefertiti and father of the famous boy king, Tutankhamun. In front of the statue, our tour guide lends her opinion on the debate of race. We are African, we are black. We are African, we are black. But they made that part of the video go so fast. To her point, she shows us the bust of Hatshepsut, the woman king who also ruled during the... Now we're getting at the video at almost ending. I want you to look at this Nigerian journalist. And the, she's standing right close to the statue of uh, Hatshepsut. Look at her skin color. Look at her face. Look at her nose, her mouth, every lips, and the statue standing. You would think they carved her, the statue was meant for her. That's to tell you. Just watch. The 18th dynasty. She's one of only two women believed to have been pharaohs in ancient Egypt. We'll just go behind. Look at the sister. She's standing by the statue of a chef suit. Where are the chief exes and all these people? They will look at this statue and say, it's not African. Okay, a live yeah. African yeah. lady. Oh, say cool, man. Yeah. You're missing a very good, important piece right now. Leave it right there. Okay. Look at the sister and look at the statue, brother. Yeah. You see what I'm Look at them. God damn it. They look like twins. Look at the nose. Look at it. The nose. The oh. nose, the lips, the face, the skin complexion. You would think the statue was meant for their sister. Right. Right. Go ahead, brother. This is what the people were seen as, oh, they were dark. This is the black skin complexion that we are talking about, that you guys are calling dark red and all those nonsense. The same complexion and all that. Same complexion. And this, this is, this, she's from all the way to Nigeria. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Behind me, we have the statue of Queen Hatshepsut. And automatically, you can see the strength of her features, her nose, her mouth. Okay, that's the end. So I stopped sharing. Uh, oh, what did I do? You stopped sharing. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> all. All right. Yeah. All right. So that's is another. The Cairo Symposium did something very important. It was what we call paradigm shift. A paradigm was shifted. And since then, they moved from white Egypt, dark-skinned white people. Now they moved to mixed multicultural. That's the game they play now. And none of them can categorically state that ancient Egyptian civilization did not come from deep south into Africa and move down to what they now call Egypt. That fact cannot be denied by any archaeologist. It cannot be denied by any scientist. Our ancestor scholar were right. 
and we are still standing on their shoulders and the evidence today lead to the fact that they were right. Yes. And so with that, y'all, if y'all have any questions now, this is the time to bring it in. Any questions? This is the time to bring the questions in, y'all. The link is in the chat. The link is in the chat. You can speak till they get here, Seiko. Yeah. So people need to understand. And I continue to say this. When um, when someone tries to speak about your history, there are three things. You, as, a, as a natural human being, there are three things you need to have in your head. One, does this person have the competence to do this? That's just one. After that, you have to ask, do they have the authority to do it? Because you can have the competence, but do you have the authority? Then the third part, do they have the morality to do it? Now, Europeans can have the competence to study African history, to make comment on it, but he does not have the authority and the morality to give a final word about it. If we do that, that's a huge mistake. Because no black man will have the authority and the morality to be a final word on the story of European people. They will never accept it. Go to Germany as a black writer and say, you want to be the authority for German history. If they don't get rid of you. Go to China and say, you want to be the expert on the Chinese history. See what they do to you on the university campus. So you can be, I'm not saying you can't be an expert, it's a scientific subject, you can be an expert, but the other two brackets, you do not have the authority and the morality to do so. That we must tell you. So every book written by European about Africa is a European perspective of Africa. That's what you need to see. It cannot be the final authority. It is a perspective of it. When a Chinese write about European, he write the Chinese perspective of European history. When American write about Japanese, they write the American perspective of Japanese history. So you cannot use their perspective to be the authority. Right, because their perspective will be about their, it will be will be mixed within their political ideology and their leaning. That's what you need to know. It's natural to do that. So when people come here, try to discard George G.M. James and say, stolen legacy is outdated. The, the Greek did not steal ancient uh, Egyptian philosophy. I'm like, wow. Who is the first philosopher in Greece, in Greek civilization? You said Thales. I said, what, what school did Thales go to in Greece? What was the first school established in Greece, a school of philosophy? All right, say cool. Let me play this one minute commercial and then I got the people in the back. They want to come in real quick. Peace to the family. This is Adul Ali, candidate for U.S. House District 12 here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Let's just be real, folks. The Democrats have destroyed our major cities. Their policies have made us less safe. They've given us less economic opportunity, and they've provided less educational opportunities for our children. And that's why I'm running for Congress, because I know what it takes to improve these issues. I've got great working relationships already in D.C. I've spent the last 10 years of my life building my political resume so that one of us, somebody who thinks like we do, could get into D.C. and make a difference. I want you to visit AliForCongress.com to find out more about my campaign. The Democrats have already done enough, and now they're putting illegal aliens in front of people like you and me, folks whose ancestors built this country and made it what it is today. So again, I'm asking you to support me in my run for U.S. House District 12 here in North Carolina. You don't have to live in North Carolina to support because what happens in Congress affects the entire country. So again, it's AliForCongress.com. I hope to have your support. Peace and love, y'all. All right. All right, family. Real quick now. Um, <clears throat> whoever got their camera on will be able to come in and ask a question. If you're scared, you might as well see yourself out, find your way out the door. 
Let's go with our brother Neil Spice. He was in here first. Neil Spice. Let's go, brother. Talk to me. Unmute yourself. There's something on the screen, so I look dark. Oh, Lord. Uh, that better? Yes. Go ahead, brother. All right. Stay cool. So, you can you hear me say cool? Yes, sir. So, you're basically you're saying we must tell our own story from our perspectives as vice as the Europeans trying to tell it because he has a political agenda that is not uh, in line with what ours are. Is that a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying, is that what you're saying? When you made that statement at the end, you were saying that uh, they were they was telling from there, they're not the authority. Well, what I, what I say is that it is okay for a German to study a Chinese history. It's okay for Chinese to study uh, British history. But if British, if British leave the Chinese to be the expert on British history, that's committing suicide. If the Chinese yeah. let Americans, it's like Russian letting Americans to be the expert of their history. You know what's gonna happen? Yeah. It's like American, right. Letting the the, the 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 Russian to be the authority of their history. That's not going to pass. And we must see history like in that light. It's a political aspect in history. No people in history have elevated other people's story for them. It has never yeah. happened. Sorry. So yeah, I'm okay. saying, why do we as black people after 500 years saying that the European can be the expert of our history and we take verbatim whatever they told us and we accept it as true. That's not what our scholars did 50 years ago. They went in the field and did the research and reversed all the racist argument that were made against us. That's the role we must, we must, we must, we must be on. That's the path we must be on. You're right. Uh, last but not least, I know that I'm just going to say, I don't see us... Um, making that, that major move right now in the next thousand years. I'm going to say that's just my word to the people out there listening. Uh, as far as making the move on the chessboard of victory, of defending ourselves. You're a chess player like I'm a chess player. You know, a lot of us used to have a problem with Black moving second, but Black is only moving second because he's defending his goal. He got all the gold or riches on earth. They're coming attacking, moving first to try to get that. We ain't doing a good job of defending it. I so what I'm and what I mean about that is we don't do military advanced technical hardware. We invented the knife, the fire, uh, gunpowder, swords, spears. And after the spear, seemed like we turned queer. Nobody built bombs, missiles, planes. So how are we going to fight this beast? We can talk all we want, just like in uh, those that, the Gap Band, at, what's that town? Uh, Tulsa. But they dropped a bomb on the Gap, and they couldn't defend it. And so Black Wall Street was destroyed. So even if what Sekou say is right, we get that out there. They can just come slap the s out of me or say cool the hell out of us, and I'm I'm supporting him, but I ain't got no army. Then they take it and burn it up like they burnt up the Maya stuff. They burnt up a lot of books. They do that. We got to get a, a military strong, and that and we got to learn this warfare. All right, all right. Um, Dr. Daniel turn your camera on. What's up, brother? You up next? Talk to us. What's up, brother? Say cool. Okay, great presentation, Sekou. Um, I think what you're doing is very important to share that history um, and share uh, the facts about the African origin of Egypt. Uh, my question for you is, have you gotten a chance to go to Egypt uh, to, to visit some of the sites? Yes, good, good question, bro. As you, as you ask the question right now, my, my woman, my wife is laughing because she know it's been on my agenda. I have never been to Egypt. I've been to North African countries, Libya, other, I went as close as Libya and other places, but I've never actually been to Egypt. Uh, it's part of um, one of my dream uh, holidays to actually go to Egypt. I, I would like to encourage you to go. Um, Brother Jabari has a trip annually. It's very good. Um, you'll see a lot of sites. It's very well organized. I've gone with him before. Uh, one of the things that I think you'll really find intriguing uh, is the tomb of Patah Hotep, who wrote the first book. When you go inside the tomb, 
you see the distinct African features of Patahotep, all the people on the wall from that period of time. Uh, it's quite a life-changing trip. And one of the things that it also inspires you to do is that it inspires you to research the history for yourself. Like one of the projects I'm working on right now is researching, uh, well, who were the first eye doctors, you know? And going back to about 2500 BC, there were seven eye doctors that were documented during the reign of Khufu in that period of time in Pepe. And, um, you know, Iri was one of the doctors, Niank, Dawa was one of the doctors, and several others that are written in the Medu Neder. And I'll, I'll, I'm preparing a presentation on this, both for my ophthalmology colleagues and eventually hope to be able to do it uh, with Sanet on the show here, just to share that with the community as well. And what I would encourage other people to do, like whatever your profession is, if you're an engineer, if you're an accountant, um, a businessman, if you research it, you'll find some of the first uh, people with their names in the Medu Neder, uh, with their stories, in the Sebaí, in the African texts, in different texts. And so there's a lot of work that we need to do to research our history, research the African origin of various aspects of civilization, from the arts to science, engineering, medicine, mathematics. So whatever your expertise is, if you really start to begin this journey of studying that history, which is you know, not been taught to the Europeans, and they're still trying to research our history and claim it. But we have to do that work also in that respect. So I just wanted to, you know, co commend you on your uh, presentation and uh, commend Sanet also on bringing this information to the people and just share that as well. Thank you, brother, Dr. Daniel LaRoche. All right, we're going right now to our brother, Ben. What's up, Ben? What you doing, my brother? Peace, man. Um, peace, peace, peace. Um, here's my, my question, Brother Sekou. I, I noticed that it is a known fact that ancient Kush founded Kemet. But what I've noticed is that they have appropriated the Kushite identity to Somali, Aromo, Ar Amhara, and these people. And my question to you is, why have they done that? Why have they appropriated the Kushite identity to these sets of Africans? What is the motive, the, the motive behind that? Well, when you say they appropriated this culture to those population you mentioned, what do you mean? Can you clarify? All right. What I'm saying is that the Aromo, the Amhara, uh, they have given, they have appropriated the Kushite identity to those people. They would tell you that these are Kushites. They speak a Kushitic language. But we know that the South Sudanese, the Dinka, the Shuluk, the, the Noor, the Lugbara in Uganda, these are ancient Kushites. These are the descendants of uh, Nama, Taharka, Shabaka, etc. That's what I'm referring to. Right. That's that's very interesting. You know, they they that's a that's a uh, in-house discussion, a place where I think uh, the research of the African school of thought need to look deeper in those area. But what we are arguing in this moment is that all of those groups you just mentioned belong to the African stock. There might be some little variation here and there. They, are, they all belong to the African stock, which uh, at certain time, the most of them were in that Nile Valley as separate groups. Even the Nubians that you were mentioning, they were at different, different groups. You had the Wawat, you had uh, the other people there. There were different, different kinds of groups that were there. So these Oromos and other people that you are mentioning right now, some of them could be new groups that just spring up out of one other groups, or some of them were there, some from the, from the beginning. But the argument here is all of them belong to the African stock. They didn't come from somewhere else. They didn't come from Asia. They didn't come from Europe. They were African and they were indigenous to the continent. That's what is important to know. But the words, in terms of the way they use the words to call these people Kushitic, where well, they've done that a lot, it's all the game the European play. 
they've done that with the word Ethiopia. When you hear the word Ethiopia today, people think it's uh, Addis Ababa, okay, Aksum. That's where the word Ethiopia is. That's where you see Queen of Sheba. People think everything is the modern Ethiopia. They don't know Sudan is the Ethiopia. They don't, people don't know that. The, the Ethiopia of the old is the Sudan. But this is the way they've changed wars around. But it's important that we educate people how these things were. Like those people you mentioned in South Sudan, they look much closer to those people we saw on the wall as Kushites. That's very true. Well said. And, you know, I asked that question in, in light of the fact that, you know, when you engage some brothers and sisters from Eritrea, you know, if you go on Clubhouse back in the days and you engage them, well, they would say, well, West African have nothing to do with Nile Valley or ancient Kemet. It was us who was there. And then when I take it a bit further and begin to look at the, the DNA of um, some of these people who that identity have been misappropriated to, I begin to see J1 and J2, which is European haplogroup. And so when I also look, I know when I also look at their phenotypes and skin complexion, and the fact that they tend to side more with the European side of things, I kind of see the motive why European ap uh, appropriate Kush to them because now they want to convey the idea that Kush have Euro-Asian phenotype or they are multicultural or they're mixed. So the, the uh, Somali and the Aroma, the, uh, the Amhara, they will fit that bill. You know, that's what I'm seeing. So I, you know, I just like to throw that out there if anybody has yeah. seen it from I, that perspective. I, yeah, I, you see one of the, one of the, uh, one of the legacy of colonialism and European colonialism was to enshrine racism in every place they went. They create colorism and because the white supremacy, when it goes down, it ends up to become colorism. So if you look at Africa today, the idea of colorism, since the colonialism ended, there is the idea of colorism. The closer to white people you are, the more superior you think you, you, you are. Because that's how the colonial government was structured. If you look more white, whether by your phenotype or by your skin color, they give you a better job. They give you a better position. So the African were fool. So before then, there was no such thinking. It was just basically, I belong to this population or I belong here. But because of the way the stratification that was done in the colonial government, the idea of lighter, the better. Okay, the lighter, the more closer you are, you, know, you can enter the office, you can enter places. The darker you are, the other, you are not invited. You can come here. So that idea is in the modern Ethiopia, even in the 50s, where Ethiopia, uh, before independence, there were some Ethiopians who were saying they are not black. It's true. I did a lot of videos of it you will find. They said that they are connected to Solomon and Sheba. They create all other stories for themselves. Even if those people never existed, they cannot find any evidence of it, but they connect themselves. But if you want to know what Ethiopia really is, you look at their kings. Look at, before Selassie, look at all the kings, even the king who confronted the Italians. Look at all of those kings and look at their phenotype. There are several ethnic groups in in, 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 uh, in Ethiopia. The one Ethiopian type that everybody know, it's not just that there is several other groups of Ethiopians. Some Ethiopian look just like you and me, different other ones. People don't know that there are several ethnic groups in Ethiopia, okay? Look at the prime ministers of Ethiopia, just watch them. The one that was there a few times before the other guy got there, just look at him, you would think he's a Nigerian. Okay, so forget about those who are saying, oh, we are not black or we are not this. The Somali do that. Even in West Africa, we have the Fulanis who do that. All of this is because in the British educational system and the French, they used to tell the Fulani that you are white, but you became dark mm. when you moved to Africa. You are actually Middle Eastern people. Mm. 
That's what they used to tell them, that you are better than this other Negro. So what they did is they make the Fulani to be less revolutionary in fighting them. That's why you see in most West African countries, the Fulani never fought the British in the independence time. They were somehow in support of them because they told them, you are different, you came from Middle East, you don't look like these other guys, you are closer to us. So it get into their head. Okay, who doesn't want to look like the master of the house? This is the dangerous miseducation that have been planted. Even all these Oromo and all these things you are talking about, these are all African people. But it is just because of this miseducation, they feel they are different. Because there was something they used to teach. It's called the true Negro. Okay, that's what Diop defeated during the Cairo Symposium. Who is the true Negro? They'll say, oh, you know, the West African is the true Negro. Oh, really? Okay, so describe this true Negro. Let's see if we don't find those similar features in the ancient Egyptian or the Kushite. You cannot. So this is where you need to know it was a mis process of miseducation. And that process of miseducation is so profound mm. that it has made some people on the continent to seek for different ancestors other than their ancestors. Even my people, the Madingo in West Africa, some of them begin to say their ancestors came from Iraq and somehow he was connected to Abraham. They abandoned Sunjata Keita, they abandoned Mansa Musa, they want to be related to the Middle Eastern. That's what your black Hebrew Israelites are doing. That's what the other people are doing. I don't, everybody wants to be connected to some distant people in the Middle East. Everything but an African. It is a year of miseducation. It is a year of programming. And it's very deep. So don't be surprised if you find a Somali who tell you, I'm not black. And you could be as black as a thousand midnight. And he said, I'm not black. Yeah, leave him alone. Like the video. Thumb up the video. I, I, I remember, I'll tell you this story very quickly. I work with the Italian Red Cross as a cultural mediator about five years ago. So part of my job was to do language interpretation because I speak Italian. So I have to interpret. Uh, there were a lot of refugees arriving from Middle East, Africa, and other places. And these refugees go to hospital for treatment, but they can't speak Italian. So I have to go and speak, both translate between the doctor and these refugees that were arriving. So it was in a big refugee camp, and all these refugees were arriving. An Ethiopian lady had a fight with a Nigerian uh, girl, and she ran to the hospital and said, an African is trying to beat me up. So, Damn. yeah. She said, there is an African out there who is trying to beat me up? Then the, 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 um, the, the Italian people rushed and tried to help her. Then they, they were like, yeah, who is the African that's trying to beat you up? <laughs> so, are, are, you, are you trying to beat up yourself or something? She's like, no, there's the African. Then we saw the Nigerian lady coming. She said, these Africans, then she began to talk. Like she was so, an African, huh? Yeah, that she's not African that the Nigerian lady is the African. That's the, so I, I froze for a minute. I froze for a minute. And that's because that job allowed me actually to come in contact with different Africans. I've actually come in contact, and this is not to denigrate Somali people. They are great people. that are wonderful. Everybody is different. I've met a Somali lady who told me that when they, they are born, their mothers train them that the greatest achievement they can have is to be married to an Arab. Hmm. The greatest achievement Damn. for a Somali girl is to be married to an Arab and have an Arab baby. This is because they said in the time of Noah, Allah put a curse on a black people. So to escape the curse, you need to marry the light-skinned people to produce a different generation that will escape the curse. I froze. These people exist. It is the miseducation. But Somali 
who have educated, who have grown, who have learned, who have understood, they will escape from this matrix. But if you don't escape, even all of us, leave them alone, let even deal with us. Even in West Africa, you will find people, why do the black men always want to marry the lighter girls? Why? Why do the black sisters struggle to get husbands? These are questions we must answer. So when you think you are even escaped the, the problem, all of us might have some of that problem somehow because of the education and the programming, the commercial, the vision we were given as how the world is supposed to look like. That has the program that has gone on for centuries. You were born in a house and there's a white man on your wall who is God, who is Jesus. You were born to see that on the wall. That's the symbol of beauty. You went to your cathedral, the cherubims, the little angel, they were all white babies. They look beautiful in heaven in a white cloud. You don't see one brown baby there. You don't see one black baby there. Then you are a Muslim. Then you read about Sayyidina Ali. You read about Hamza. All of these people, they look white with the Arabs and the beard. And they speak Arabic. They don't speak African language. So your sense of beauty, your sense of what is wonderful and beautiful is foreign. There is no way you are going to love your own. There is no way. Okay, that was. I, I have a lot of stories. Another part I will tell you. I in Gambia. I, I went to in Gambia. There is what they call the Marabu in Gambia. The Marabu are Islamic, uh, are Islamic uh, uh, seers. They are fortune tellers, but they use the Quran to do it. People don't know that they are Sufi, some kind of spiritual Muslim. They can predict your future, and they use. They said they use the Quran. What have you to do that? So my, one of my sisters took me there because I told her that I wanted to do business and I needed to have some good luck. Those days, how we were thinking. So my elder sister took me to this marabou and he threw the throw on the ground and checked the, the Quranic verses and the Hadith. And he told me, for you to be welded in life, you have to marry a white lady or a very, very light-skinned woman. That is your destiny for you to succeed because you are very dark skin. So for you, <laughs> because I'm black as a thousand, and this man talking to me, he is darker than a thousand midnight. But he said, for me to succeed, I need to marry a white woman or a lighter. And these type of people exist in West Africa, the marabous. To marry a white woman or light skinned woman is considered big luck. Ask any Madingo to tell you from Guinea, from Mali. So I'm telling you the programming is deep. So don't get angry with the Somali. Don't get angry with the Eritrean. It's in all of us. That's all I wanted to say. All right, nobody you, else. Bro. What's up, man? Nobody else would like to come in, y'all. Come on, come on. Where's my man, Elder Yara? Where's Brother Gideon? I know they got some good questions. Let's go. Let's go with my man, Black Lion Supreme. Let's get it in, y'all. Come on. Um, Next week, I got Minister Inky going up against uh, Lord Abba. It's going down. Them two brothers. Oh, man, they was on the phone earlier today, and they, they finally came up with a title. And it's a good title. It's a good title. All right, let's bring in the brother. Peace, brother. What's happening with you? Um, next week, yeah, I got blessed. I like going up against our Lord. You got, you, yeah, you got to put that other thing on pause right quick. Mute. Yeah, man, yeah, man. Blessing, brother Sekou. You know what I mean? Peace. Respect, respect, fire, respect, yes, sir. I want to, I want to know if the item are aware about how um, they have the government of Egypt, they're planning to do restoration projects on some of the pyramids and things like that, and they're planning to restore the pyramid, the pyramid of Menkari. And um, I want to know what, you, what your opinion on that would be, and if it is, it might be a, it might be a kind of way that they could try to alter history now. Yeah. 
Can you say that again? You said they want to restore the pyramids? Yes, they say they want to do restoration work on the pyramid and men curry. Uh, so because oh. apparently it, it has some little um have a hole well, in it. I I really don't but know. Somehow, but when I heard this story come across, it sounds kind of fishy, like if the Egyptian government remember now we can't really trust them too much, you know. So I feel like if they might try to tamper with the with, with the structures and them to a degree and possibly try to repaint certain certain They've been um, doing that. schools and yeah, thank you, Akam. I think they've been doing well. The one thing you need to know about Egypt very quickly, they but more than Egypt, there are two political school of thought in Egypt, the Islamic Brotherhood who are very extremist, who don't want to have anything to do with the ancient Egyptian stuff. They even want to, to them, they, sh they are all satanic stuff that should be burned down. Those group exist. Then you have the moderate European leaning Egyptians who want to sound like they are democratic they want to uh, 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 be liberal. They are the one who, who are using Egypt as a source of income, the ancient Egyptian antiquity as a source of income. But all of them combined together, they are Muslims. And to them, the great there is no one evil after Satan than the Pharaoh. No one is evil to the Muslim after Satan than the Pharaoh. But this same Pharaoh is the source of income of their country. This is how hypocritical that entire country is. They name their national team the Pharaoh. But when they go home, they tell their child, Pharaoh is the most evil being that have ever lived. But Pharaoh is in the museum, and that's what is their source of income. There's to people to come and see the Pharaoh. So you have you are dealing with the people who are not mentally right, who are very hypocritical. They are only looking for money. Um, Doc, thank you, Dr. Daniel LaRoche. Thank you, Robert E. Mitchell. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate the donation. Thank you, Dr. Daniel LaRoche and E. Mitchell. Go ahead, say cool. Sorry about that. Yeah. So they anytime they say they want to restore something in Egypt, they are trying to attract Europeans funding. They are trying to get money from European government and institutions. That's always the mission. It is how to get some money. And they are not doing it because they have any type of respect for all those antiquities. Do you know of any Arab country where they dig up their ancestors and put them in museums? No, they don't. Even in Saudi Arabia, there are places they said, no, no archaeology, not allowed. You cannot dig this part. You cannot touch this place. But in Egypt, they are all Muslim and they do it because it is the income that they get from it. It is all about business. And that's what they do. They repaint it. They've done it. The Aswan Dam they flooded a lot of artifacts. They've destroyed a lot of things already under that water that they've kept because the Nubians, there's a lot of things that are pointing to the southern influence of ancient Egyptian culture. They got rid of all of those stuff. So everything they are doing now is just business. People need to know this. They do not really care about a handful of them who really uses this Egypt thing to get money out of it. They are just doing it for European pleasure but they do not really care about these things. That's what people, the day an Islamic government takes over Egypt, you will be very, very surprised. Some of those things in those museums will disappear. Believe me. All right, say cool. We got some people in the building. Let's get my brother, Asar M. Ka is here. I see you, Gideon, and I see the other brother, Moses. So let's go, Asar M. Ka. You got the floor. Man, ETE, I'm going to tap your... Uh... Shout out to the panel. Big up to my big brother, Sean Netcher, and my brother, Seiko, in the building. Um, What you say is true. The money for tourism is what sets Egypt up. That's their main source of income. So uh, it's important that, uh, you know, you're aware when you go over there, you know. Um, I have friends over there. If you don't have friends over there, you need to, You sometimes you need to tread a little lightly. You need to be careful um just understanding the dichotomy of the people um 
So I sent you my uh I sent you something so that we could, you know, do what we do. But uh say cool. Um what do you presume is necessary to reinstate correct mindset in uh South Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia to get this crazy thinking out of their head that the dark skin is a curse? All right. Good question. One of the things I've always said, and I will continue to say it, is that the educational system on the continent is still largely controlled and funded by Europe. The curriculum is not designed. If you want to design any curriculum in African university, the European donors will come, the, 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 the Rockefellers, the other people that put money in, they bring and they said, let's see it. What is in there? They have to remove anything that will raise the consciousness of the people on the continent. And they put in stuff, things like Mongo Park, discovered River Niger. This person discovered in 2024, they are still saying they discovered the River Niger. And our kids are taught that. So right. I'm saying... The African, unless the African Union create a cultural center where every books, books that are public, cultural books, scientific books that are coming out of that continent are really controlled so that information that lead to this racist, colorism thing are removed and are, are, ex, are sifted and removed out so that real knowledge is passed on in our elementary school up to college level. If they don't do that, there is no way you are going to destroy this colorism because it's deep. So is are they forcing you got like I just talked to my partner from the Sudan. He says in when you're in school, the the language is Arabic. Is that the case in West Africa as well? No, West Africa escaped the Arabic uh imperialism because there were some the empires there were a little bit stronger and the language they maintain their languages but places like northern nigeria and so arabic because when you see the nigerian money you see arabic writing on it the northern part of nigeria they still hold on to some arabic but sudan is a very special case what has happened is they are there are the arabized sudanese have decided that they must destroy any element of african africanity in sudan they want the, the, the language. You cannot speak any language. You will be beat up in the school. You'll be thrown out. You cannot practice any cultural activity if it is not Arabic. Arabic. That's why South Sudan broke out. And they broke out because they had a consciousness to do that because they were Christian. If they were Muslim, they wouldn't have fought their masters. So the fact that they were Christian, so that created a little dichotomy. So they were able to be able to see that it was imperialism. But most of Sudan till today, the Nuwa Mountain, the Nuba Mountain, they are still, the, the remnant of Kushite people, they are there. They speak their language and everything, but they are not allowed to use it in school. They must speak Arabic. And the Arabization of Sudan by force is the reason why that region remains unstable. Excellent work, my brother. Uh, you definitely uh, handled your business the other day on here, and uh, I commend you. ETE M heads up. Sal, let me know. Presentation is ready. Um, we good to go. I'm ready to work. When you ready? When are you ready, brother? I, I, I thought I we was going to do it Saturday. We could do it tomorrow. We got, there you go. I got a slot tomorrow, so that's good. What time okay. is good for you? Uh, it, uh, uh, any, 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 any time is good. Early as possible. Okay. Okay, I, I'll give you a call and let you know what's up. Okay. Don't go nowhere. Stay right there for a minute. I want to show you who I got coming up. Okay. Uh, next, I think it's Thursday. I got a call, and that's why I didn't put the date on it. But I got a call, a brother. And um, I think it's Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. But the same thing that we're talking about, did y'all see it right there? Hmm. Lord Abba and um, our brother Inky. And he got... um. Are uh, we degrading ourselves by calling ourselves black? Inky is coming from the position of hell no. And he's going to go into deep history and show 
where our ancestors also called themselves black in different languages and, st and stuff like that. So that's going to be good. Look forward for that. Lord Abba, I think, is coming from the perspective of the Moors. He used to be a Moor. He don't run deep and heavy with them no more, but he still is a Moor. And so, you know, that's his thinking. He still got that, that thinking there. So that's going to be great. <laughs> coming up on Thursday. I think it's going to be Thursday. Don't quote me, but I'll get it right when I post it. Inky, you better right. win that. You better win that discussion. Yeah, that's going to be great right there. Okay. Let me get on over to Moses. What's up, man? Talk to me. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Um, to say cool, because because say cool comes from a foreign land over here, but he's familiar with tribalism, right? And um, I'm Puerto Rican, and growing up in this country, you know the history after 500 years as like the, nat the native population either mixed or died off, whatever, right? So me myself, we weren't taught our history, something that I had to learn. And how do you feel that it's the same way with, with uh, I can, we can relate with, with black African, black African Americans where they, they're looking for their, their history and who they are. And same with Puerto Ricans where they say that the Aino died off and stuff like that. And the science has been proven that we have, we have that in us. So as, as many Latinos, they're a mixture of uh, Native Americans of these lands and they're learning their history as well, right? But this is conquered lands. So we had to live amongst like the, uh, those who have conquered and where it's going now. And the same with black people who, who don't feel that or, or they feel that they should take over in a sense, right? Same with Africa and what South Africa went through with their lands as well, right? How do you feel that, how should we feel about all these other nations? And again, yes, I look white, but I also have a mixture of uh, Native American in me. So we kind of, uh, uh, tribalize and, and relate to each other We're, because of that blood that's in us. The same with the black um, African-Americans who have African blood that, that, that goes back to where you are. Now we're amongst whites and so-called blacks and all the Chinese who come here and they don't care about the past of what happened here. So we're a people who are learning ourselves and also uniting and yet we have to come with, with these 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 grounds that that are been conquered in these lands how should we feel about the rhetoric amongst white people and black people and their fight when these are our lands and you can say i'm white by my white skin but i'm i'm part of 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 the history of these people here all right let me first thank so, kind of going into that how did let me thank my man how do you feel about that let me thank my man zane wills if i pronounce your name wrong please forgive me Zane Wills, thank you, my brother. Appreciate the donation. Say cool. You understand the question? Yeah, I would like for uh, brother, is it Moises or Moises? Sorry, I want to. Make that's sure close I'm... enough. Yeah, that's close enough. I, I went through that. Yeah, that's fine. Moises. Okay. So yeah, it's, yeah it I'm can sorry go either way. If I, if I didn't pronounce it right. Yeah, I would like you no, to, to contextualize your question. What exactly? When you say, um, how do I want you guys to feel? Can you explain what you mean? Okay, like when you speak about uh, 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 black people or African descent of knowing, knowing their history and where they should go in the future. And this, like even in Canada or the United States, how should, how should the people that are originally from here feel about doing the same? Should they feel right. that, yeah. Yes. So should they feel the I, same? Yeah, I'm in Canada here and we have native uh, Canadians who actually had a very difficult, difficult, difficult history. And even until today, they face a lot of challenges. So Canada have a tradition here where they call it land acknowledgement. When you go to college or any of these uh, centers, before you start anything, they say, we want to acknowledge. We are on the land of the Cherokee and what have you. So one time I stood up. I'm like, if you are on the land of a people and you pledge allegiance, give it to them. I don't understand what is the pledge that you are on the land of the Cherokee. The Cherokee is still alive. So if you are on the land, give them the land. I don't understand it. So they were like, no, it's a way of just trying to recognize them 
So I'm like, this is hypocritical. It's like playing game with people's future and their destiny. I think the native people of this part of the world, what they need to do is to understand that they have to put their tribalism first aside. They have to look at that they have common destiny. And they were here first, and they had a lot of in common than, the, than people think. So that a lot they have in common, they should build on that commonality and build institution where even if these states like Canada and America will remain, they should enjoy some level of autonomy of having some part of that country where you can have a nation within a nation where they can have some level of autonomy in their own area, not be floating in the country as if their history now has been melted. It has become a museum history, where as if they don't have a future to, to uh, a path to create for their future. I think that's very misleading. They have to organize because all these states you see, they will pass away. Every civilization have passed away. Once, once there will be a time, America and Canada will be history books. So what will happen then to you guys when that happens? That's why now is the time that all these tribes need to build institutions to organize themselves, consolidate their culture. If possible, let's create a national language. Don't just because we speak English, it's fine. Somebody planted this English on you. Somebody decided that we must speak English. The, the, the white man from Britain decided it. We were not speaking English. So you cannot say that man must decide your destiny forever. So that's what I'm saying. If I were to be involved in any Native American movement here in Canada, I would tell them, organize yourselves, build institution. Those differences among you, because I hear European categorize you into Métis, into this, into that. That's where they kill you. That's even with black people. That's what they've done to us. They'll say, oh, you're African-American. Don't talk to Sekou. He's Liberian. Don't talk to Jamaican. Yeah. Don't talk to. Okay. All right. If you don't talk to each other. Then what's well, going to well, happen? Uh, hey, hey, Sa, before, that, no, before that, yeah, you answered it, but you can't create that movement here because you would be. Try to keep the answer a little short. Say, cool. We got a lot of people okay. here. Man. They want to okay, give it. <laughs> yeah. So you say you can't. No, yeah, because I'm muted, I think. Can I, can I speak? Yeah, we No, here. because it will become. Yeah, it becomes like an uprising. You can't. You kind of. We kind of like developed the mixing of the future of, of of Europeans who came in here. We're fighting that battle of, of of having our own Americanism, right? And the same with black people. When black people, okay, you want to uh, retake Africa and your history. I get that. What now? If we do that as well, it, 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 how how would that look towards you if you're telling people to go back when they're not originally from here? So this is pretty much the future of where we're going here in America, where in our history, the same with Egypt, whether it died off and other Africans and the, and the white men went into Europe, it's, 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 it's leading into the future of a mixing of a, of a new people. You can't really go back, back into, we already established who we are. We're learning that ourselves, the same with, with, with the black men in America learning who they are, right? But we can't retake these lands because then, well, we, we, there's gonna be bloodshed, we gotta go to war with, with, with the government. So it, it, we, we kind of have to go into a wave that we have to grow together. And I, I think that you're, the way you speak, it seems like, like a movement that we have to do. Imagine us speaking like that. So my, my, my point of view is that we have to come to some, so we have to grow together. There is no, no, no we got to kick people out and go back to this. We're, we're leading into a future. This is this is kind of like where I can speak what I'm speaking like, but that that's as far as I want to go based on well, a lot of these conversations. And you guys are not the only one, so yeah. But. What I what I hear you say is that you were sleeping midnight in your house, and a man bumped into your house and kidnapped you and your family, and put yes. you on a boat, and you don't know the destination of that boat. Then you wake up and say, "It's fine. We are in a boat. I know the boat is moving." I don't want to destroy. Do you know your destination? That's all I was well, saying. It depends on perspective. Now, if you create a brotherhood, in the you, boat, you, you you create a tribe because it's a tribal thing. It's not a colorism thing. A boat you right? never created, and you don't know its destination. And you are just the inside. The destination is the future making, of man. This, 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 this is the way the way the mindset goes. So, so what you're saying, we need to take control of the boat, not ride the boat together, based on your point of view. 
I'm saying try to know all the right. destination all right. where all you're right. going. That's all right. We got to move. Okay. I'll leave it at that. That's fine. Hey, brother. Um, say Thank you, sir. Peace, brother. Say cool. The brother right. there, you see the number on the screen? Not the number, but you see DMG. D right there. Yeah. Peace to the panel in chat. Sorry, don't forget to link, link with the brother. Don't forget to link me with the brother. I just sent you his number. I texted to you. Okay. Good brother, good brother, good, good, um, good shows he be having. He want to do an interview with you. He want he needs you to come on. Good All brother. Right. A lot of us been on there, so that's brother Pianki. You know, you familiar with Pianki, right? You seen him before, right? Um, brother Cole looks sometimes he comes the on. Face looks the face looks familiar. Yeah, um, yeah. So I just text you his number. And uh, let me go to my man. Uh, where you at, brother Gideon? You still there, Gideon? Gideon, damn, Gideon left. He was next up. You know, lost your place in line, brother. Oh, he froze up on the screen. Oh, he, he's drinking. He's turning himself around and all that. Stuck in the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brother Gideon is stuck in the matrix, man. All right, let me go to uh my, my man, Elder. Yara came in late. Let me get my man, Elder Suntan. And then Yara, Suntan is on you, brother. What's going on, Sam? What's going on, brother? Say cool to the panel. And to everybody, uh, say cool. Here, here's the thing, brother. Long time no talk. Yeah, peace, Suntan. Peace. I'm happy to talk. see you, man. You're looking Good strong. To see you, man. I, listen, I be listening to you. Uh, it was hilarious over there with uh with our brother Chief, man. I, I've been laughing at that thing for three days. Yeah, y'all y'all had me down laughing, man. But um, <laughs> let me get back to what I'm saying. Uh, in the grand old scheme of things, say cool. Colorism is important. However, resources are more important, and we have to have a re. We I understand what you talking about. What that brother was just talking about. It's kind of off topic because us as a black nation, we understand what happened to us. And we also understand that we've been degraded and we have our resources taken. And along with that became colorism because the white supremacist um, source took these things from us. And then if you white, you have resources that somebody dark don't. I mean, you just we say you got it even if you don't. Just like I tell a friend of mine, I say, look, man, I'm 64 years old. I got a million dollars. Here go a white man, 64 years old. He got a million. We both fall on our face. That white man might have a trust fund to bring him, bring him back up. What I'm going to do, I'm going to have to get back out here, scrape and scramble to get that million back. He got many doors that's going to help him. So colorism is very important, say cool. And the thing that we have to do is just what you said. We're going to have to get together and get our resources to back us because South Africa right now, people don't know this. See, I watch World News as well. South Africa is rising up right now. They're not taking no stuff. They don't believe in what Israel doing to the um, Palestinians. They don't believe, you know, we, we, we getting on our feet. It's not going to take a thousand years like my brother um, Splite said. So my question to you is this here. Light skin, dark skin can be a problem, but with resources, it, it changes. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You take a light skinned pretty lady, right? And you take a dark skin, not so good looking man. And if he got resources and money, she diving right over there with him. You see what I'm saying? So in the grand old scheme of things, not only have they made darkness a stigma, not only have they done that to us, they took our resources. So, Sai, we are set back with resources. That's our big problem to the panel. We are set back to resources. And what we do as a whole as black people, we go at each other because we don't know of no other which way to go. Everybody want to be smart against the other black brother, but you don't want to be as smart against the European, who's the one who set this whole thing into motion. And I'm going to say this, and I'm going to leave on this note. I do this every morning. Do you know I get up five every morning just naturally, right? And I count the commercials in the TV program. It's white, white, 
white people, white people, one black, white people, white people, two black, white, everything is white in the morning, man. So you got to look at this construct and you got to understand it and it's getting whiter. But the thing about it is we rising in the back. So I'm going to leave this with the panel in the world who are all listening. The black people coming, but we have to have our resources. So if anybody's smart enough to get them, get to resources, then we get our military, then we can get ourselves together. Peace. Yeah, peace, peace, peace on time. Yeah, it's it's the colorism is an issue. And Big like issue. you said, one of the way I define a race, because as people say race is a social construct, like right. uh Ang loves to say. But I say it's a power construct. That's it's what it is. That's what construct. I just said. Yeah, it's Go a ahead, power Dennis. construct where it, it is believed that the lighter skin have to have power and resources. So because of that reason, they want to maintain the privilege. They have to make sure they keep the other people down the ladder. If you have black people in power right now, they, that idea will change in a second. So it is a power construct. Right? It has power is very, very important. So this is where we have to understand that we've been dispossessed and we need to empower ourselves. Black Africa has been dispossessed and anywhere in the world, this, this system of uh, a power construct, they always try to dispossess us. And we have been playing along. Even in this day and age, we've been playing along with this, with this, uh, uh, with this game and then we are paying for the consequences. Okay, when we get billion, look at our brothers, when even Africans who come here, like me, they, they come to go to school and then get some, as soon as they get some money, they look for a white girl to, to marry with all their millions. They play football. You watch the football in Europe, all those great football players, as soon as they get there, they, they leave their girlfriends back home in Africa, in Nigeria, Liberia, who work hard for them. They work together. But as soon as they get to Europe and they get signed by Chelsea, I'm by Milan, up. the next girl in coming to their houses is oh, a white damn. lady. Damn. This is what's been going on. You know what, Sekou, I could have said that, but I am did and I'm glad you did. So keep yeah. speaking. You're right on point. So right on point. This, this is the issue. We have to understand that we have to empower ourselves. If we don't have power, the Europeans have a code. They know that they must be on top. That they don't joke with. And they, they use that code anywhere. They don't even have to speak it out. They understand that they must be on top. If there are two, three anywhere, the code is, we must be on top. Okay? For us, when we are two, three anywhere, oh, no, there's so much black people here. I'm going to, I don't understand why you having problems that there are so many black people there. I will hear people move in an area. I move in this area. There's no black people there. I'm the only black. And the person is yeah. saying it with comfort. You should be. When I was growing up in the 90s as a kid, we were playing outside football in the rain without shoes. And we see these American Peace Corps, these white people. When we see one white person coming, we run. We run into our houses, shut the door, and we start peeping through the window. Because we don't see these people often. We are like, what kind of people are these? We just watch them. When they call you, come, I give you biscuit. We run. We think they are some kind of alien or spirit. They are scared. That's how we grew up. But now it's turned around. It's like when we see them, you have to gravitate towards them. And this is the programming that has been done. Naturally, people think that black people just naturally love other people. No, they were programmed to love them. They were programmed to love them. There are documents from Congo during colonialism that the moms would birth the baby, put oil and put them in the sun. The darker you are, the more handsome. The darker you are, the more beautiful you look to the Congo of that time. But the Congo of today, the bleaching cream is making billions of dollars. Right. Something change. Something right. change. That's right. And I appreciate you for that, man, because you're right on point. And I'm going to, you know, keep doing what you're doing, Sekou. That's all I can tell you. You know what I'm saying? All right. Yeah, look, listen to this. I'm, I want to say this. They got the NBA wives. It's on uh, online. You can type it up. NBA, NFL wives. All these jokers, man. <laughs> what, no brown skin sisters, my complexion, Sekou complexion, or uh, uh, Asa complexion. All these 
NBA football players, all these had these yellow or white wires, man. And I just look at it and I just, you know, because. But no, no, stop, Suntan. Let me tell you something. You're right. You're right. I'm not taking that away from you. But there are more black wives in the NBA than the European ones. They are showing you the European ones to say, this is what the standard is, brothers. Yes. This is what you go for. So, yeah. of course, they put them on the um the NBA shows and show you them. But the majority like that, of them are black on um, yeah. white. Hey, Sam, yeah. let me say this to you, Sam. I don't coin myself as I may be an elder to you just by a few years, but see, you just taught me something, Sam, because I didn't look at it that way. Yeah. You know that? Uh-huh. I, I didn't look at it that way. They are really putting that out there like that, so to say, here. Here yeah. it is. That's right. This is the standard right. right here, y'all. This yeah. is the standard. You know? That's right. Because I was pissed, but I don't say nothing. Like I said, I watch TV, you know, just in my thing. I had a knee replacement, so I'm at home. Man, there's so many white commercials. When y'all go, everybody on this panel, watch TV and watch all the commercials and everything. Everything is white. Then they mix. They trying to interracial it with a black man, white man, white. They trying to interracial it now, right? And then this the kicker right here. They put all the, the black gay brothers together and they show them <laughs> pecking each other. And they, oh, I mean, you know, I just oh, I, this thing is getting crazy, bro. No, so, you know, I just don't like that. You're right. They are actually showing gay men on commercials, man. Yeah, man. Right. And then all that. It's crazy. And they suing them with a disease. Really, you can't really hide it now from your no, because no. it's open. And if right. you if no, listen, if you was to get into a fight with a gay man in the street, you done. Because no one would say gay bashing. Even yeah. though they got rights. Because they got rights. <laughs> Even though he started the beef and you finished it, you yeah. end up getting arrested, brother. They're going to piss you up. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, they're going to say, oh, he yeah. was gay bashing and he was doing this. Yeah. Your word against theirs. Who do you think the judge going with? The goddamn judge is gay. Oh, no. Right. You're done. <laughs> right. Who you going? Hey, who going to win? <laughs> hey, hey Sam, we not even gay bashing right now. Right. We only talking what's gay right gay. and wrong. Yeah, right? I just want to make that clear. We are not gay bashing. Yeah, see, I wanted to make it clear. To defend ourselves now, man. Right. The, the smart way. Let me get on over to Elder Yara. Elder Yara, what up, brother? Peace, Let me Yara. come off mute, man. Peace, Peace to you, Suntan. <laughs> Elder Suntan. Peace, blessed Suntan. You wild, man. <laughs> but you're right on, man. I agree with you and Suntan, man. I agree with y'all, man. It is getting ridiculous out here, man. It's to the agreement. I don't, I have to monitor everything my son watches on YouTube cartoons yeah. everything else man like they trying to push that agenda they got cartoons now with two dads in them like y'all got to be careful with your kids out here so man it's that's y'all y'all spot on with that um but uh again shout out to say cool man i thought it was a, a, a excellent presentation man much respect to you man for the work you put in uh learn uh, a lot from your presentation man it was very solid and um you made one statement earlier on uh, in a part of your com in part of your presentation. You were talking about how uh, that the uh, uh, white scholars or the white Egyptologists somehow uh, found uh, began to just regulate what we would call uh, black African or African cultures just to Egypt and not go outside of of of, of the land of of of, of Egypt. Uh, and some of these other different cultures that we see uh, during that particular period of time. Um, and uh, the, the, because it is always my, um, it is always my understanding that the further we go back in history, the darker it gets, right? Um, and so uh, I think that um, what, what I've been hearing, and I heard uh, the, the other, uh, the guy on here I debated not too long ago die say this, I heard, Carol Cooney even allude to this as well, is that that even though um, Egyptology, as we as we have understood it, even before they got when they got to uh, the UNESCO uh, 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 conference, right, that it was it was pretty much dominated by uh, white males, right. Um, and one thing struck me when I was listening to Carol Cooney's interview 
she says, well, the, the, the baton basically, and I'm paraphrasing what she's saying, that the baton of Egyptology being uh, uh, being dominated by white males didn't pass on to Africans or, or African-American uh, scholars, but it passed on to white women. And now they're running with it. And I just thought to myself that that was something that was very problematic. Although I shouted out Garfield that I thought it was a very great interview. I even had my son listen to it because even in there, whether we agree or disagree, we could see the formulations of how ideology and how these things began, began to work and play out. But I thought that was very uh, crucial when she said that, that how somehow now she felt that she was the safeguard, a part of the safeguard now for uh, African history or Egyptology now, right? Uh, and that her and, and her thing was, and I heard Dodge come on this channel and say it with Dodge, and I was debating him that it should be placed, it should be taken out of the hands of the white men. Put it back in, and put it put it into the hands of white women and placed in the context of, uh, of of white matriarchy or matriarchy as a whole, right? Taking it away from page, the patriarchal systems as a whole. Why the civilization the civilization uh, 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 fail, right? Why we had these collapses in these intermediate periods that we see that we should all just place it place all the blame on the African. Right. Place the blame on the African. And then uh, uh, simply because it was a patriarchal dominated society and it should be placed into the hands of the matriarchs. Right. Uh, it would have had a better chance of surviving. But now uh, the, the, the white women in Egyptology are not a safeguard. So what do, what do you say to that? Yeah. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, the way you asked your question, I you have, I can tell that you are a very good listener because I listened to that part of the video <laughs> and mm -hmm. I have issue with it as well. But the way you articulated it, it showed me that you were a very good listener and you took note. Yeah, she used the word patriarchy a lot mm -hmm. in that interview, mm -hmm. trying to present the entire issue as if it was a male versus female issue in the history mm -hmm. of humanity. And, you know, this is one of the things Diop dealt with in his book, uh, The African Origin of Civilization, where he said, when Europeans teach history, they see the world from their perspective. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't look at all other people's perspective. Their perspective was the world began with men dominating everything, and the males were in charge, and they were brutalizing and oppressing women until we got to this age where women are trying to liberate themselves. Diop said, that's not what happened in the black people context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you go back, our women got power. They were, they were rulers. They were in position. So don't bring your feminine stuff with us because we had a different structure of society. Our women were in businesses. They were in charge. We had women who were ruling kingdoms. So this thing is a European virus. So don't, don't make it a universal issue. So when this lady was talking, she was using the same thing. He, how Egypt was patriarchal and, and it was a patriarchal society. Let her compare that to Greeks. Let us see if it is patriarchal, where you have a woman. What, who, what female was king of Greece, of Rome? What female ruled over there? We had female pharaohs. In, 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 in right. the Nubia, we had the Kandake. So you, if you're not careful when listening to these people, they try to put things in the European context. And that's where the trick is. And the mm -hmm. way she put mm -hmm. the whole thing, I, I, I kind of agree with you. It's like now the men are giving up this discipline to them. They're the white women. Mm -hmm. So it is now the destiny of Egyptology is now in their hand. They will now decide and see how to fix it. I think that's why they are avoiding Cairo Symposium because the Cairo Symposium actually told the African, now take the mantle. It belongs to you. Mm -hmm. It seems that, mm -hmm. unfortunately, most black people have become coward. They don't want to take the mantle. Egyptology has been officially given to us in 1974. That's what people mm -hmm. don't see. 
because they came with a theory and that theory was debunked and the African theory proven to be true. Then that's where we were supposed to start a new paradigm. But unfortunately, we fall back to the master and say, we don't think we can do this. Come and do it again. So <laughs> Yo, check this out. I want to share something with y'all. And um, I want I want YouTube to know that this is uh, just for teaching purposes. You know, we are not gay bashing anything. Here I want to tell you what this sister have done. She went into her son's classroom and she ain't playing. Let's check this out. Not. Wait, what are you doing? Oh. Not. Did y'all see that? Y'all see what's hanging up, right? Yeah. yeah. Look yeah. at what she does. Come up in there. Wait, what are you doing? Not. Not. Oh. Not. Oh. I can't. I am not paying my you. I am Mom. not paying my tax Mom. money. Get out. Support. Get out of this type of now. You like, why do you have this hanging? And why do you have this hanging up? Uh, it it's, part part of, it's part of the students. Here. No, it's not part of anything. Mom. That is uncalled for. Mm -hmm. We are paying you to teach history. And that's what you need to be teaching. Excuse me. This is a public school, little your, lady. Uh, you are a child. You are to you see the no, 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 no. no. This needs to go exactly where it is. In the no. garbage. You need to go in the no. garbage. I'm, I'm teaching my oh, son to grow up to be a man. Get and out. I don't want you hanging on right. flag. I'm calling security. Hanging wow. a flag up I'm for you security. to sit up there and you teach them the type of stuff I'm trying to keep them away from. I told you it would happen. Right I told you. No. I told you somebody here gonna get mad. You need to. She's funny. Yo, she went up the news and said, hey. I'm paying you taxes to teach history. She's a history teacher. What the hell you got that up in the classroom right. for? Now you see, she's right. right. The sister she's is right. right. You don't pose to right. put that on every kid in the, in the damn classroom. Every kid, yeah. Like well, kids that go in there, you try to make it look like here. This is what this life is about. It's all right to do all of this. Yeah. It's just crazy, man. Yeah. Well, here, yeah. here's the issue, sir. And you probably yo listen. That's you, not you, what I'm paying you for to teach my son. Right. I, I'm teaching him to be a man. That's what she said, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you you probably remember from the 80s. I know Yara and Suntan, my brother, everybody on here. Matter of fact, you'll remember in the 80s, the issue was not uh uh are you gay? The issue was being discriminated for being gay. Because you if you was gay, you might catch the whooping. We might beat you down. Um, we might break you up pretty tough just because we wanted you on a straight and narrow. So once that happened and and we we you know the the gay bashing stopped which was actually the gay bashing when you give uh the old saying is you give a negro an inch you take a yard and uh <laughs> they took a they took a whole football field so when we go into the schools unless it's a sex education class we shouldn't be discussing that and even in the sexual education class, that should only come up with people who have sex for pleasures that they enjoy. It shouldn't be during the normal curriculum because that's not how you it's procreate. Right. So that's it shouldn't appear everywhere. Rainbow shouldn't be here, there, the and this, that, and the other because of two things. One, you're talking about sex in class, which is a no-no any damn way. Right. Two. Yeah. <laughs> if right. you're gonna do it, it has to be in the appropriate setting. It's not a sex education class. So right. if you're in a history class, there should be no rainbow flavor. This tricks are for kids. We know right. what it is. Now let me tell you, back in back in the days when I was on the street with the bullhorn, I used to go in. I used to tear it up. I used to go in on the flag and all that. Right? Mm -hmm. right, and I, I tell the story all the time. I have a sister who's gay. I haven't spoken to her for years because I disapproved of her lifestyle. I've said this story many times. I disagreed with it, and so one day I went and visit my mom's, and my mom's was crying and begging me to talk to her because she was there too, you know. And I'm looking at my mom. I'm like, damn man, I'm really hurt. My mom. Next thing you know, I just go in there, hug my sister. 
And and that was it. I just stopped with the gay bashing and the gay yeah. culture. So I'm not homophobic. It's what y'all want to do with y'all life. Y'all do what y'all want to do. Yeah. But, you know, everybody ain't got to um, agree with your shit. And yeah. Everybody ain't got to be subjected to yeah. your shit. Right. Let me tell you how this real quick. A lot of this people, guy. Not, we ahead. have somebody in our family that's that's that way. Not all of us, but a lot of people do. All of yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's all of us. To my sister for years. And when I did, man, it was like it felt good made, though when you hugged the dick. Almost made me cry. Yeah, because she was crying. It felt good when you hugged her, yeah, man. man. Uh -huh. You got that off of your back, man. So yeah. that's good, man. And you know what I don't like, y'all? I don't like when these trans lady, these trans dudes go over to be a lady and then do the kickboxing stain. Man, this dude beat the hell out this black lady, man. I was so mad. Oh, I'm so glad I'm the champ now. Dude, you a man. He beat the heck out this black lady. You know, that MMA thing, right? Jack their head. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Oh, they're they're also school. Mad, yeah. And they don't and they letting this go. They let them play in high school on you know, it's just crazy. So I'm not gonna get deep into it. We just gotta get our re hey fellas, we we must get our resources together and then we gotta go out and you know put them together. We need resources. That's the only the, the black man we, we have been raped of our resources, period. And you know, us with a good mind. It's a lot of us, Sai, like you, Sai. You got out there with the bullhorn. You brought money home to you and your wife every day. You got, because you went out there and did. It's a lot of us got that get up and go about ourselves. But the thing is, is there's so many of us who sat in this box, in this bubble, and it then confused them, man. Their mind is messed up and they can't get out the box. So we sat far behind in this race. However, we got intelligence, man. We the one who built the pyramids, our ancestors, so we can, we are, hey man, look how, um, look how far we didn't came since slavery. We got doctors, lawyers, we got everything, man. But you know, this mindset is just, well, I got it now. So I'm at the gas station, I'm a doctor. I'll see this guy out for money. I'm gonna toot my nose up at him and I'm going back out, you know, in Michigan, it's Bloomfield while the rich yeah. were. So, you know, they tip their nose up and they don't give them nothing. And I'm just saying, man, that's the way it is now. And it's bad. Say, cool. We're not, we're not going to get nowhere till we get our resources. That's what we, we, and we got a lot of strong black minds that can handle the re Everybody not going to Walmart when you get a check for a thousand dollars. A lot of these brothers are here going to flip that grand and get another grand and flip that. You see, we, they, they didn't bring that, that we didn't have no, guns and hair on over in the hood. Somebody brought it there and we flipped it and a lot of people did good with it. A lot of people went to hell with it. So all I'm saying is let's just keep our hold our composure, brother. Get our resources. That's coming from Sun Elder Sun Ten to all y'all and to everybody listen to, to the sound of my voice. We must get our resources together. Other than that, we're gonna be in the box. So that's it for me. All right, let me move on over to Kimmit. Kimmit, what up, man? Talk to us. Uh, I said, what up, what up, So I'm just listening to the brethren. Uh, yeah, say cool. Hey, fuck, yeah, I mean, you always, you always spitting the truth. You, all of y'all, man. Suntana met you a couple times. Um, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just digging the conversation, but yeah, yeah. <clears throat> just to stay on stay on key um yeah they definitely i mean like you said in the commercials it's in the cartoons i'm proud of that i'm proud of young goddess for going in there uh protecting her her young god you know what i mean mm -hmm. i'm and uh like when that uh youtube movement first started um and they were they were i don't know if y'all any y'all remember this but they were trying to get they were trying to get the sisters to join it and then kind of put them as the face of the movement but the sisters for the most part wasn't going for it they didn't and I'm, I'm so glad that they didn't and i tell my goddess all the time like yo i, I appreciate all y'all for holding it down you know i know we ain't always the easiest you know but you know you love us and thank you and and that's it that's all, all right, you know man so, yo, we're about to wind it down. Yo, stay cool. You can close us out, man, so we can be out of here. 
Yes, man. Thank you so much, Santan, uh, Elayara, Kemet, uh, Brother Saim Ka, uh, Konjet. Sorry, I don't know if I pronounce the name. Thank you all for coming, you know, to put everything back into perspective. Um, 50 years ago, our ancestor scholars, Sheikh Anta Diop and the living uh, elder Obenga were invited by UNESCO that they were trying to write the general history of Africa. So there are two problems. The first problem, they said, oh, Africa never wrote. They left no books. How do we write their story? So that's what they told Diop. Diop said, African never wrote. All those writing you got inside the pyramids written by who? They said, oh, OK, yeah, we understand. But you know, it's North Africa. He said, oh, so the North Europe is not Europe now. <laughs> they were playing games, playing games with us as if we are kids. OK, this is what these people do. Someone can sit, they can, they can be sitting right before the pyramid and they tell you, African never wrote. And you are standing in front of an African architecture. This is the level they have gone. And when somebody lies so much with confidence, you think they are saying the truth. Because they say it with confidence. The European is a master of that. He can look at you and say, I discover your village. I discover your town. You met me there, dude. I'm fishing with my family. And then you say you discover it. And we should put you in the Guinness Books of Record that you discover my village. So we that you met there, how do you call us? So all of these things we are going on. So Diop was like, you know what? Let's have a debate. Because you guys have been running the show for a very long time. You were caught in the shot. You were the one, the masters of African history. All of you, let's meet in Cairo and let's put on the gloves. If you win, then let that be the origin, the, the official history of Africa. If I win, you guys have to back off. And they went into the battle. And UNESCO said, every ammunition that Dio brought with Obenga, there was no reply. They couldn't stand it. And they won the game. So now what they want to do, they want rematch. And we said, there's no rematch, we won. OK? Since that time, they've called for three different uh, meetings. There's the one they call in Dakar in 1996 or so. They said they need another Cairo symposium. So the Africans said, are you guys ready for this? They say, yes. They say, OK, let's meet. This time it was the German and all of that. They said, OK, come for the rematch. Guess what? They brought fake hieroglyphics, papyri, to where the Egyptians were insulting the Nubians to be black. And they put it on the board. And there was a brother there, Kuvit Gomez, who could read. He looked at it. He said, this is fake. What papyrus did <laughs> said this from? The meeting ended. The government of Senegal have to hide the video. They embarrassed the entire scholar. The you guy went and created fake hieroglyphs and come and put it on the board. They have been doing this for so long. So the Cairo Symposium was unveiled everything. Now, that's what happened when you take possession of your history. No one can defeat you. That's what happened when you decide to be the master of your own destiny. But when you decide to ride behind people, they will always lead you somewhere that you never bargain for. So you need to be in charge of your history. That's what we need to do. That's why on Sarnetta TV, they say, bring sources, bring sources. It's not about the source. It is about who is behind the source and what does the source say, the interpretation of the source. It's very important. I can bring you a source that tells you this, that tells you that, but it's that source based on the facts. And what, who wrote that song? What was the intention? What is the interpretation? These are things you need to look at. And one you need to know, even long before Cairo Symposium, when it was said that Africa was the origin of humanity, do you know that Europeans, for a very long time, they refused to accept the idea? To a point, they went and created a fake fossil. It's called the Pilled Down Man. If anybody can tap in the Pilled Down Man, on, 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 on the Google, P-I-L-T, then down, then me. they created a fake fossil to show that Europe was the origin of humanity. And for mm -hmm. nearly 30 to 40 years, it was taught in university. 
It was one professor who went to check the score. He found out that it was glued together. It was made of skull of monkeys and what else thing fake. Dog. They created it and said it was the first human in Europe. So humanity came out of Europe. These people can do anything. So you sit there, they make a DNA and they said, this. are you serious? You think these people are going to sit down one day and say, okay, you know what? We gave up Africa. You are the origin of civilization. You black people, you were the greatest people. We gave up. It's not going to happen. That's right. Stop waiting for that moment. Mm. See, stop waiting for that moment. So I'm saying to the young folk who are listening, who are coming up, they are in college and university, read the sources, but read with your third eye. Read with deeper understanding. Go and do primary research. Go to the field. Do research and find out the truth. No one is going to glorify our history for us, and no one is supposed to do it for us. If I question the intelligence of anyone who thinks Europeans are supposed to write good things, nice things about us, why should they do that? Why should they do that? So with that, Sarnetta, as a peace, Eurocentrism has been defeated, and direct knowledge is the way forward. Peace and blessings. All right. Peace and blessings, everybody. We out. Peace Thank y'all. Appreciate y'all. Peace, y'all. Yeah, peace, 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 cool. Peace. Love you, dude. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. Peace, brother. Y'all raw. Peace, peace, sir. Peace, my brother.